we're heading out live. Going live, going live, and now we are officially live, or so it says. So we'll see if that's the truth or not. But yep, I want to welcome. You. Are we good? Yep, I see you. <clears throat> okay, yes, sir. We're live. <laughs> we're live. YouTube stream is up. We haven't done this in a while, and boy, we have um, a lot of people here. We got William, we got Catherine, Sophia, um, Jamie, and Ross is also here too. Awesome. And we may even get Mr. Eric Spitfire on here at some point. So that's really cool. Um, this is a, uh, it's good, good to do these for every, every now and then. And um, I know we have a lot to cover and William has a PowerPoint. And um, I was hoping we could kind of start it off here. Um, once we can verify, okay, yeah, it does look like we're live on YouTube. Yay. Um, okay, so what I'd like to do is I'd like to really start it off. I have a question for everybody here on this all-star panel. Jamie knows a lot about all-star panels because he has them all the time. Um, let's see here. Okay, here's a question for everybody. And um, we'll go around. I don't know how we'll go around but we'll figure a way to go around. I'd like to have everybody answer this question. How would you describe this case to somebody new? That's what I'd like to know from everybody here. Um, who wants to start first? It's I'll, a conundrum. It's a conundrum. <laughs> I mean, let's say, let's say, you know, you're kind of meeting somebody, you know, you guys are hanging out, just chilling, and all of a sudden you're like, hey, you know, this, you want to kind of bring up this, this case. What do you, what do you do? What what do you say to people? I would say the same thing that I said when I came on with you and Dan the first time, Greg, which is uh, it's it's quite similar to the Kurt Cobain case as far as how evidence was found and the scene of the crime or the crime scene rather. Nice. Good one. Good one. All uh, right. I'd probably say you know, this is uh, this case. It's not cut and dry, but this is something we should all be paying attention to because this could happen to any of us. Hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, I I think um, if you go into speak to somebody new, like um, for this case, trying to keep it as basic as possible because there's so much that's involved in this. There's there's no answer to this question. If if we can if we can show them snippets of what um, David Crowley was doing, that he was trying to produce a movie and saying that the new revolution will never be televised, we can show them that and then take the next step forward further by saying, okay, at once upon a time, three members of one family got killed. Here's the proof, here's the evidence, and let's go from there. But there's a lot more to it. It's, it's a journey that, where can you start? I'll just say, just give them just the, the snippet of what David Crowley was trying to do, try to expose the new world order, and obviously combine that with what's going on with today's society as well, because he did, hindsight, predict what was coming. Good point. Um, Sophia, what are your thoughts? Uh, I agree with keeping it as simple as possible because there's so many different rabbit holes with this case. And I don't know what else. Just keeping it as simple as possible. And that, and that means... Normally, I just don't bring it up. In right. conversation because it's so complicated. Yeah. So. so do you keep it simple? Keep it to just like um, you know, hey, this they found him, and you know what they, you know, the strange, the little strange things about it. Um, mm -hmm. he, that he he's yeah. a soldier. Is that really relevant? That he's a soldier, a filmmaker, his twenty twelve um, trailer, some of those basic things like that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then. Uh, I start referring people to like the documents in the group because you need to read those 
to really understand the case. Watching the documentary does not help you with this case. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, so you just throw out everything that you saw in that thing <laughs> and just go straight to the document and start looking at that. <clears throat> that's what I try to tell people. It's like, just forget everything you saw in that documentary. You were lied to. <laughs> and read the documents because that tells a different story. Yeah, throw out everything in that thing for sure. For sure. <laughs> well, see, I'll still watch people in the documentary once I know that they're a critical thinker because then they can go actually go through this and actually break things down. Okay, well, this doesn't seem right. You know, like, I mean, I went through my first time and I saw it. I was like, this, is, this isn't making any sense. This doesn't add up mm-hmm. here. You know, go through the you yeah. know, documents and then you see it even, even more clear. So, awesome. yeah, exactly. Or when somebody comes into the group and they're like, well, the documentary said this. And it's like, no, no, they're wrong. <laughs> you know, right. the dog had food, at, you know, there was food there. <laughs> mm-hmm. There's things like that. But, you know, like you were saying, but like like many people that been looking into this case, only one thing that should be should be done. I don't know how we're going to do it. I don't know who's going to do it. But the case just needs to be re reinvestigated from top to bottom. I mean, there had been some rumours about yeah, it could be doing it could be going down that road again. But to to keep to get the doubt out of people's mind that somebody else could have done this or so forth, so forth. The whole investigation of this murder, I'm going to call it a murder anyway, it needs to be reinvestigated from top to bottom. Now, the only problem with that is that some of the scenes inside the house has been reconstructed since the mm-hmm. event. So it's going to be a little bit harder to investigate <laughs> properly and thoroughly the things that they didn't do properly but we know this, law officials have always been corrupted inside their own police force. Yep. They don't do their job properly, they just want to brush over it like, like they can sweep it under the carpet. But we've got, we got photographs, we've got police video, we've got the 911 call. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to say about the 911 call too. We've got all this, we've got all this evidence, but now... It, I really believe if it's still an open case, like it has been, they should re-investigate re- it, go through it all over again to keep to get the debt out of people's mind and stop all these bickering and fighting of these all these doubters as well. So, you know, just redo it. But the question I want to ask is, there, has there definitely been a gag order on certain people that can't speak up? If so, well, yes. Well, I want to go back to what you were asking, Greg, and you wanted us all to answer, and how I always view this case and tell other people, um, if, if, I, if the same believe half of what you see and none of what you hear was ever applicable, it applies to this case. Don't believe half of the things you see and definitely don't believe anything you hear from anybody who's associated with it, because most of it, as we know, is um, geared toward leaning people and pointing them all in the wrong direction. So. Mm -hmm. Absolutely agree on that one. Um, How about Mr. Eric Spitfire Wilkinson? If you can hear us out there. How are you, my friend? Hey. Thanks for having me. Whoa. Coming through a little hot, hot and heavy as usual. That's the Spitfire spitting (laughs) through the microphone there. Great, uh, great comments so far. My question's always been... That's a little better. Because nobody picked up the, the ball and run with it um, in regards to this movie, you know, and, and I think the answer is it's kind of a rhetorical question because what happened with David Crowell and his family scared the hell out of a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And nobody ever wants to touch a, a subject like this, um, especially the, the amount of truth <laughs> that we were seeing in this movie, you know, there's a reason why this happened. So, you know, so I'm still crossing my fingers that somebody is going to be courageous enough to 
and they have the resources because it does take a lot of money to make a movie like that. Um, pick up the ball and, and run with it. Yeah. Right. Do you, um, if you had Eric, if if you had a, a chance to just chat with somebody to kind of like introduce them to the to this case, you know, um, what what would what would be some of the things that you would focus on? Uh, well, I'd start with the fact that we're talking about a, a in my opinion, a war hero, mm -hmm. a, a veteran, his wife, and especially the small child that was murdered here. And, uh, and I do say murder um, with all my heart and all my conviction from all the evidence out there. I was covered up. Um, for somebody who's never seen it, yeah, this, this guy was making a, an amazing movie that was showing more truth than any movie that I've seen. Yeah. Um, okay. And he was very close to uh, achieving this goal. He had the uh, investors lined up. He had uh, contracts lined up. And <sighs> suddenly... Uh, you know, he went crazy, according to uh, the narrative, official narrative, and uh, killed himself. You know, his, his image has just been completely tarnished now um, to those who want to believe the official narrative. Um, even his friends were saying, going along with it. And there was something we have to look at here with this. Again, uh, for people, again, I'm kind of getting off track because people haven't heard this, but he was about to make a movie that was going to blow people's minds. Uh, the truth of it, the surveillance part of it, and what, what's coming and what we're seeing right now um, was in his script, a lot of it, including this, uh, this pandemic. And uh, so if people are wanting to look in this further and see what's, what's going on, I definitely recommend uh, getting uh, Greg Fernandez's book, The Gray Stage. It lays it out spectacularly, what we saw here in that book. And... Um, you know, just uh, go to YouTube, look up Grey State, and watch the trailer. That pretty much tells you the whole story of what he was going to put out. And I, I'm wondering if anybody on the panel has seen a movie that's even you know come close to the truth this this was going to expose. Hmm. That's a great there's question. A few movies out there like mainstream that um, they were exposing quite a bit. I mean, there's Eyes Wide Shut that also exposed some stuff that was going on. Well, that's still going on. Sure, a lot of symbolism um, in that movie, certainly. Um, yeah. But I mean, Dave was just putting it right there in your face. Oh, yeah. he, was, he was very blunt with it while Kubrick was just like, okay, well, this is, we'll use the symbolism. We'll go and give off some scenarios here, but we're not going to give off the whole thing. So, it's like you were saying, though. Right, right for sure. <clears throat> there's, there's still a movie I want to see called Captive State. I don't know how relevant it is or how similar it, it, it is to, um, to this to this whole David Crowley thing. It seems like it's really not, but I'm just curious about it, that name. I was looking up last night some of the names, like why would David name this Gray State? What what did he really mean? It's a common question I get all the the time about, you know, what did David mean? Like why is it why is this called Gray State? What is the Gray State? What does David Crowley consider the the Gray State? And I love that title because the more I think about it, the more he kind of keeps it open for, for all of us to kind of make our own in, interpretation of what we think the gray state is. Um, instead of, you know, we could say, I, I, to me, it's like, it's not a, it's not black and white. It's not a, it's a police state, but it's like, it's, um, it's I don't know. It's, it's uh, somewhere in the middle where it's like, you have good cops, you have bad cops, you have good soldiers, you have bad, bad soldiers. You have this like, Every, everything is just thrown into this state, and then all this chaos happens, all this criminal corruption on top of criminal corruption in a post-pandemic type world is really what it, what it seems like, too. And just mm -hmm. things just get nuts. Um, both, both scripts that, I, that I've read of David's, it's just like everything is completely um, – it, it starts out in chaos. The 2013, maybe a little bit more. But um, they both really start out in this chaotic world where something has happened. Some type of false flag thing has happened that has triggered the whole world um, to kind of, or at least the, the USA, to go into this quote-unquote gray state. And it kind of seems like anyone could look at what's happening in their country right now, and you, you may be living in a version of the gray state. It's pretty trippy. And, you know, it's interesting because I see it the exact opposite. I, I look at the title 
in read the script and I think of the term of gray state like you think of a, a gray man or being a gray rock mm. that's somebody that and something that just kind of blends in mm. so the the constant changes here and there just blended in and, and just kind of went with the flow and nobody really paid attention to it because you don't pay attention to a gray rock you don't pay attention to the gray man and then the result of allowing that gray state to occur and then the, then then the movie then shows the result of allowing a gray state to be that's how i saw it that's pretty interesting yeah, yeah i see it a little bit of both of, way, uh, of what catherine's saying most of what catherine's saying but i see what greg's saying too and i definitely agree there's what he's saying about it it's see it's in my in my personal life people i see everything black and white um i don't sit in the fence but with the gray state there's a lot of grey areas in society, whether it's a police force, government, and mm -hmm. comes down to people. But there's more. There's more to it than that. We know there's corruption. We know there's going to be turmoil. We just didn't know it yet back in 2013. But if you go a year before the grey state or David Crowley, there was a little preview, a 12-minute preview from the london 20 olympic games the opening ceremony that was on a global stage and they were demonstrating what was about to come now when it comes to the gray state it even went a little bit further like david was showing the people that hey you are going to have microchips you are going to be programmed you only have you know food stamps to get your food but you have to go through this different maze or whatever you want to call it to survive. And this is what it was all about. It was about survival. Imagine if the world was turned upside down, there's chaos everywhere. It was about a battle of survival. Mm -hmm. And we are facing that in today's society that we need to survive. Food is running low, fuel is running down, well, most importantly, the fuel prices are going through the roof. We're facing this. And David was trying to expose that before the event actually even happened. Whether you want to call this a fictional story or semi-non-fictional story, well, we can now say it's non-fiction. If you want to look <laughs> back at that little that little movie preview that he was doing, right, even though it's a little bit more into it. But if you want to say that, you can say now, looking in hindsight in 2022, it's, a it's non-fictional. You know, the ship has sailed now. So if, if people are still sitting on the fence with the quote-unquote pandemic now, well, you have complied. I think that sitting on the fence gray area trying to figure out just to get along yeah it's a different thing in my book you know I, i'm not a bench warmer that's just me that's just me yeah you don't you don't seem like a bench warmer for sure <laughs> yeah. and that's that's what this world needs we don't we have enough bench bench warmers i think here you know so um yeah, that's all. It's always good to always good to have you guys on. I just looked up what is the gray state, and uh, first some propaganda came up, um, but then I, I don't know what this means. It says gray state or gray state dying, uh, as in D Y E, um, or fabric a fabric or a material not yet dyed. So something to do with like color dying, um, a fabric dying. That's just weird. Anyways. Way yeah, off. Very well, could have used it. Like <laughs> well, I, don't know. I don't know. Go ahead. Look at the um, Webster dictionary for what gray means, mm. because it okay. it not only says like neutral colors or something that's in between uh, a color, but then they're talking about gloomy, dull, mm. and stuff like that. Uh, well. And, it, well, sorry to cut you off, but well, sorry to cut you off, but um, I'm, you're on the good on the good topic. But black and white is not a color; it's a shade. And mm -hmm. same as gray, same as gray, it's a shade. It's not actually a color. It's in between the black and the white. So, yeah. 
um, yeah, I do see things black and white, but there's no right or wrong when I look at that. You know, I look at both sides of the of the of the narrative. What's the good side? What's the bad side? But there's something I want to bring up too. I mean, it's not just a grey state. I mean, I know there's shades of grey as well. That other movie, but I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about. But you get what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Um, black, white, grey. It's not a color. It's all a shade. And That's weird. I, I always thought it was a color. I, I'm going to no, go black back and white to my. Are not colors. I'm going back to my teacher, and I'm going to. I'm going to tell them. They really messed me up. <laughs> and that's what's frustrating is because the dictionary is saying the color gray, the color black, the color white, yeah. but they're not really colors. <laughs> yeah, they're <laughs> not colors. You learn that in art school. What's so up Jamie's that? right. But, you know, here's the thing, though, with David. It's like whenever he did something, how I see him is he does everything in layers. And it's the same thing with this title. You know, there are so many different ways you can interpret what a gray state means and you would probably be right with every single one because every aspect is covered in the script. It's just amazing. I, I, I can't disagree with that, that's for sure. I have a word, uh, gray state um, with another state, um, which goes perfectly, strictly by the definition, police state. Police what state. exactly is a police state? Yeah. And this is where government institutions exercise an extreme level of control over civil liberties and society, which is what we're seeing right now. Um, there's typical little or no distinction between the law and the exercise of political power by the executive and the deployment of internal security and police forces play a heightened role in governance. A police state is a characteristic of authoritarian, totalitarianism, and illiberal regimes, contrary to liberal democratic regimes. And that's you know, a great state in a nutshell. Yeah. It's a police state. That's kind of what I always thought maybe that's what David meant. And I think looking at his uh, trailer, his 2012 trailer, that's kind of what I thought. And, and reading the scripts, too, it kind of falls in line with that whole police state thing. Um, but it, it seems like, like there was, you know, there's 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 people on both sides, I, I guess, is kind of what I, what I found. A lot of, like, ex-soldiers are some of the patriots are some of the um the with the pro pro protagonists in in his scripts it, it felt mm -hmm. like you know and there was there was a lot of that um the main character in the 2014 script is a he works for the cop he is a cop when this whole thing happens and then he get he gets framed um so it's it's pretty it's pretty interesting just that just that name but yeah i always kind of associated it with police state and the police state movies and um the research you know back then it was like and here here we kind of are because i never thought they'd be knocking down doors in this country in in any country kicking down doors uh even though they were doing it at the time david was doing it all of our soldiers were over there fighting two fake wars two really you know corrupt wars and knocking down doors taking people's guns only letting them have one gun finding caches of guns in their backyard shooting people and just all this craziness here um and i just i i don't know i always thought that it would never come here that we would never get to that to that point i mean nobody's knocking down my my door now but that doesn't mean it's not going to happen oh, Version, uh, um, real quick, that's the extreme version, which you know, um, it's almost like uh, um, Jamie's telling us, "Hold my beer." <laughs> What's going on in Australia? Um, one more thing on this here: the inhabitants of police state may experience restrictions on their ability to express or communicate political ideas. Again, what we're seeing on social media, what we're seeing on on YouTube, with the purge of all these great alternative media uh, voices exactly what a police state would be. Right. Yeah, well, see, this is another thing I wanted to bring up. Remember when, just after the 9-11 happened and when they brought out the terror alerts after that, where it was a color code, you had red and yellow and orange and green, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Well, right. in my in my opinion, with a gray state, it's a, that's kind of like the terror alert, but the gray state, it's the top one, where there's going to be chaos, where there's going to be turmoil, where there's going to be every citizen running 
to the hills or trying to survive. This, I look at it. I look at it the way that they did with the terror alerts, where it's red, with danger, yellow, moderate, green, yeah, not so much. That's a grey state. Grey state is the top one, not the black, not the white. The grey state. If you want out of out of chaos, out of turmoil, out of it's what we're going right now, especially yeah. here in Australia. Especially here in Australia. I mean, now it's now it's time to put all these people together. And to go back to David Crowley, I'm just going to say it right now. I know some people won't want to say it, but I'm going to say it for my own benefit. This whole case needs to be reinvestigated from top to bottom. Well, the other thing too we should also be looking at too is I think that is that if you read both scripts, they weren't fully like in a, in a point where they couldn't fight back, right? They could still fight back. The tide could turn to the other side. Okay, now that's what I, I that's what I kind of captured from this initially, um, and even what what Catherine's saying about you know it, really uh, he probably just got this on layers so that way it's pretty much however you want to determine or you know, determine what this means or interpret it, it, that's how it's going to, it is probably still correct. And so I interpret it as just basically this, is if you look at both scripts, how both these these movies are set up, you look that the main character is kind of shifting the tide of war, right? So you got uh, Daniel Nikasi, he's got his dad who's really like the big bad, you know, and what is he doing? He's doing everything in his power to basically stop him. Well, they leave us with a very, very uh, ambiguous ending, which we don't really know, you know, like is, um, oh, what's his face? Um, Danny Mason's character. Is he, you know, is he just a figment of imagination? Is he real? Is, you know, what's going on with this? I think he's real, but it's still end of the day, you know, they left you with this kind of, this could change. Um, which obviously is never going to get made now, but th th I think that's the way they left it. You know, set himself up for the next mm -hmm. movie. Did it seem like that to you? Oh yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Right. Both scripts came up the same way. They leave you with this cliffhanger, so that way there could be more. Uh, he was—I mean, he was obviously trying to. He wanted to still make more, which that's why I, I know that's for a fact. Why like he's leaving it open that way. Right. Because that was kind of his goal. He wanted to continue. He wanted to make more to go with it. Um, especially if you're going to have a TV series, which is what everything was leading towards. Um, if you read the journal, you get it from there. You get it through, um, through what the mics had said. Things like this. I mean, you you know, they was going. It was going towards a TV show rather than a movie. So he adjusted things, and we know he adjusted away from the 2012 slash two. Well, yeah, the 2012 trailer how that was going to go, he shifted to more of a um, less occult-based one and more just, you know, war, I know this is going on, and trying to put an end to this um, one-world government is really what was going on. Yeah. And there's also another, uh, not a movie, but a series on Netflix that was, um, it was pretty good, but they went in more into the, uh, the alien invasion type or otherworldly beings as being um, a big part of, of what happened, but it was a called Colony. Um, and it was pretty well made, and uh, you know, but sticking the aliens in there um, kind of took away from people really looking at some of the finer things in here, like the same things that were in David's movie, cut off the information. Um, you would think at Netflix or Prime or something like that, um, there'd be at least a dozen documentaries out about this COVID-19 thing, about this, this pandemic, about what's happened the last two years. Where are they? There aren't any. <laughs> Um, Eric, can you, Eric, is it possible for you to, I don't know if you're on a microphone or if you're just calling into, is it possible to lower the, uh, the, the mic? Oh yeah, sure, sure. I, uh, actually my other, my mic cord burned out on my main mic, so I'm using my, uh, my wireless. So let me turn this down a bit. How's that? Is that better? That's much oh, better. better. Thank you. Michael. Cool. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like you're blowing so much. It's <laughs> <laughs> Jane. Um, so Ross, I got um, You actually spoke with with David Crowley uh, back in um, 2012. Um, looks like the interview was done on September 9, 2012. Um, did did uh, 
did you ever ask him that? What what is the gray state? I haven't listened to this in a in a while, but um, did you ever ask him that? What the gray state is? <clears throat> um, yeah. Again, like I said, it's been a while since I listened to that interview myself. Uh, I, I think we did cover it uh, in the interview, um, and basically what we came out is, you know, it was kind of that backdrop of. Uh, I mean, I think all these, you know. These other people before me did a pretty good, uh, pretty good uh, job of describing it. You know, with the terrorist uh, threat level and the and the police state and whatnot. But um, yeah, it just essentially, you know, it, it makes sense. I think to call it the gray state universe, and um, it's just essentially, you know, the uh, the world where you know that that narrative or story takes place, which is um, you know the culmination of. Um, you know, the coming, the coming fall of the government with the, you know, militant police state, I guess. Mm -hmm. Pretty much what you see in the trailer, you know. Okay. Yeah, and I'm going to put that in, in the chat room. I'll put the link to that if anybody wants to go and check that out. It's, it's, really, it's really good. Um, it's worth listening to. I've got a question for the panel. Um, I've just been thinking about this. It's a community back at Clark County around the area where the Crowley family was murdered. Have, have they been still talking about the case? I mean, I know here in Australia when we have a, a specific case, especially like the Beaumont children here in Australia, they, the children hasn't been found for over, well, come up with 60 years. Wow. Almost. Jeez. Right. Those type of discussions can be heard at the dinner table like the body in the barrel murders here in South Australia where the people were cutting up pe um, people's body and putting them into a barrel and dumping them in an old bank vault. I mean, those type of discussions can be still heard today at a dinner table. Wait, hold up. Hold right. up. And they, were, they were dumping them in a bank vault? Yeah, there was an old bank vault course up at Snowtown. This is what they... If you go on YouTube and look at Snowtown murders... And it's called the bodies in the barrel, and they had these like they plastic drums, and they were just putting them into barrels with some um, sulfuric acid, and they were putting into a bank vault. A it's old, it's old, old, old. It wasn't a, a currently an active open bank, right? Yeah, it, it it was an old bank vault. What the murderers did, they bought this old bank, right? It was empty. It was empty, right? So they bought this bank. Now, they were telling people that the bad smell that you can smell at the back of the vehicle was dead kangaroo, right? They weren't kangaroo. They were human flesh that were put into a plastic drum with sulfuric acid. But though, this is what I'm saying. Those type of conversations here in Adelaide and some parts around Australia can be still talked about at the dinner table. I'm just trying to translate that back to David Crowley. Are these type of conversations that we're having still happening in the community of Clark County at the dinner table? Uh, yeah. Good question. Yeah, that is a great question. I, I, you know, um, I mean, yeah, we can only, yeah, one. we can only speculate on that, I, I guess, right? But I know um, every time that somebody sells a house. Um, where these where these crimes happen, they have to kind of tell people, I guess, right? They have to let them know, hey, there was a. Um, I don't know. If, actually, I don't know if they have to do that unless it, they're unless it's specifically with David's house. Each state is pro probably different, but I mean, the people that actually witnessed it, um, the people that that saw um, the bodies and the people that have heard about it, you know, living there. Like, I know if if that if something like that happened where I live, um, but I'm sure we'd, we'd still be talking about it. We'd still be, you know, talking about, especially the, the strange, so the, all of the strange things that are tied to this case. Now, maybe people don't want to focus on that and they just, you know, oh, this guy was crazy and he killed his, killed his family. So for the, for the neighbors, I can totally see why they would not want to venture down this big rabbit hole that all of us have kind of gone down because it's it's a pretty scary thought when you think about that and when you think about the fact that there could still be a killer out there and they may be in they may still be there or killers you never know 
you know, but um, that's a that's a really good good thought. I'd be curious to hear um, if there's any neighbors or any friends that are listening um, in that area in the Apple Valley, Minnesota area. You know, drop it, drop a comment. I'd I'd love to know if this is still something that is being um, well, talked about. That's, that's another thing too. Besides your book, um, Greg, there hasn't really been any other book being written about the David Crowley case yet. No, and to answer uh, Greg's question real quick about um, in most states they do uh, require. Oh, they do. If, if there was if there was a violent death that occurred, um, not all, but most do. Yeah, mm -hmm. to do that. Yeah, Greg, I, I think I got something on on that. Uh, unfortunately, my neighbor just uh, committed suicide literally the other night uh, with his family home. It's about halfway down my street, which is a dead end private street. Two million dollar house. I left the house and saw six cruisers outside and they literally didn't tell anything like i'm telling you they didn't go around the street knocking on everyone's door like they questioned literally the people who lived like right next to that house you know mm -hmm. what i'm saying but other than that they didn't go around the neighborhood and knock on every door every door and notify everybody so uh that that's southern california so <laughs> i think it's quite a different policy state to state i would guess yeah, yeah well, that's what i was saying before with when it's a serial uh, not, not serial, when there's a serious case, you know, many, many years later, it's still being talked about at the dinner table. I'm not saying everyone's talking about it, but you, if, if you want to be a fly on the wall, you will hear a conversation about a certain case that happened here in Australia, especially where I live, in Australia, called South Australia, we're the murder capital of Australia. Right? Like the Beaumont children, they disappeared in 1966 and those kids had never been found. Suspected, they had been suspected murdered, but the bodies had never been found, right? Not long after the Beaumont children, we had another child abduction at Adelaide Oval. That person hasn't been found. And those well, types of questions... You couldn't have around the table about things like that. I, I think that uh, Grace Day goes into the uh, category of handy sook, where you're either on one side or the other. You're you're a whole person if you believe otherwise. On either case, same same type of deal. It's true. Yeah. yeah. So we're just looking at here the murder capital of Australia, Australia and South. This is where I live in South Australia. It's crazy. Why can't Adelaide? Why can't Adelaide bury the myth? Because the problem is, there used to be a club here in in South Australia. It was, it was like a gentleman's club. You had politicians. Judges, <laughs> right? Like, it's all there, black and white. And these type of conversations are still being talked to today. All these different, like from domestic violence to child abduction to serial killing. Like, there was a, there was a club here in South Australia. It was like a gentleman's club. We had judges, lawyers, police officers the government of South Australia, all involved businessmen, all had their part to play in it and they kept their mouth shut. Hmm. Jesus. And, you know, this is, this is what South Australia became. Like the Truro murder, you just read there in the art article, mm -hmm. the Truro murders, yeah, just there, yeah, the Truro murders, that's up north of Adelaide. Like the snow town, bodies in the barrels, I just mentioned that one. It was in the 11, 11, 11 people, you know, 11 people. The family murders, that's the, that's the one I biked about um, last week on Southern Truth too. The family murders, you know, the Beaumont children, the unsolved disappearance of the Beaumont children. Max Egan, check this out, Max Egan was playing with the Beaumont children just before they got abducted. Yeah. Wow. That's his very wow. wow. Max Max Egan was was living in South Australia at the time. Now these kids had never been found for over or it's come up to sixty years almost, right? Sixty six. The Beaumont children never been found. There were three children that were at a beach on Australia Day on January the twenty sixth, nineteen sixty six. Never been found. And popular beach. Uh, Jamie, now why was why was Max Egan around these uh, children at the time? He was living. He was living here. He was living here at the time. He was at 
Max Egan was, was the same around the same age as your eldest child. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> not not the, I got you. Max Max Egan was a child back in sixty six. Sure. Yeah, that's a long time ago. Max is pretty yeah. old though. <laughs> but yeah, he was I didn't realize he was a kid. That's was very, very interesting. <laughs> yeah, Max Egan was a kid. He was living he was living here in South Australia at the time. Sounds like the Delphi murders uh, out here. Yeah. yeah. That's but, another big one. But going back to my point, these type of, what I'm saying now, and you're reading it in the article, these type of discussions are still being talked about at someone's dinner table here in Adelaide. Mm. When it goes back to David Crowley, are these type of discussions, what we know, still being talked about in the society? Yeah, I, th <clears throat> I think when you when you put it into that context, I, I would say no, because a lot of people, from what I'm finding, still have not heard about the David Crowley case, have no idea um, that who, who this guy was and what happened here. Um, so I know it was a big deal. You know, it kind of I mean, the, the best thing about the 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 documentary A Gray State is that it helped people um, know that there was David Crowley, that there was a person named David Crowley, that all of this stuff did happen. Obviously, it was totally slanted, but um, I don't think it's gotten the press. The David Crowley case has not gotten um, the press that it really should have. Um, and every time that it's brought up, it's always the same thing when we're talking about you know, oh, this guy went crazy, killed his wife, killed his kid, and blah blah blah, killed himself, and that's it. You know, he was he was he, he thought the government was coming after him, et cetera, et cetera. But um, if putting it into that context, I would have to say no. I don't I don't think too many people even know know about this case. Maybe even people inside of of that state too, or even in that that area that live there, they may not have have no knowledge that something like that happened. Right down there. Well, I would have think there. that local news covered it, Greg. You know what I mean? So yeah. I mean, it, and it seems like there's not much going on out there. Uh, I, I don't really know the area well as, as some of you guys do, but uh, but that's basically what I was saying. They, they would have a better chance of seeing it covered in local articles or the local local True. nightly news stuff that you guys covered than you would having law enforcement going around door to door, <laughs> knocking on, you know, telling you unless you're a direct neighbor, like I was saying. Yeah. And then there's some people that are trolling online that's really not helping. I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, no kidding. It's always, <laughs> always going to be the case. Judy! <laughs> yeah. Judy! <clears throat> Excuse me. So, yeah, yeah exactly. Come... Plural. Plural, so... plural, just saying. It's a plural. Yeah. So I don't, I don't want to scare people, but if you come to South Australia, you might accidentally get yourself killed. No, you won't oh, get thanks. killed. Won't. Oh, thanks, Jamie. <laughs> yeah. you, Jamie's, just, Jamie's just trying to keep us out of Australia. That's what I think. Well, I mean, I think the, the quarantine camps are doing plenty of uh, that already. So. <laughs> yes, hey, at, at, on the positive side, at least we'll still have a major party if we all get locked up in quarantine, we'll still have a major party. Don't worry about that. Okay. Well, that's true. Gulag parties. Let's do it. <laughs> Always looking at the positive side. I, I love that. Um, <laughs> let's see. Um, so I think maybe we'll go through some of this PowerPoint here. Um, maybe Eric, maybe if you could turn your um, mic next time just a little bit lower, I think that that will oh, it's still down. okay. It's still it's, it's still, oh, it's still a little high. It. It's not as high, but um, How's I that? think we're getting better right there. That sounds better. Is it, is it too loud though? Still? No, no, that's oh, actually that really good. Now. I think, yeah. Okay. And um, what the heck's going on with this slideshow? Why is it showing that? Or is that why is it showing the next slide? Oh, I hate PowerPoint sometimes. Right. It's such a nightmare. <laughs> why is it showing that taskbar? Don't show that. Don't show that. I don't know why it's showing the side thing over here. That's going to drive me crazy. If I can get this. Uh, see all slides. Of course, that never happens. It's so odd. Why is it doing that? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I've never had that happen before. Maybe there's something on the side there. Um, anyways, may just have to go with it. But the beginning. 
Yeah, I don't know why it's on that. You can tell my knowledge on PowerPoint. Uh, unless it's a display yeah. setting. I don't know why it's showing that on the side. I don't want Neither that. Neither do I. It's a little odd. It's... Can I man minimize it? There you go. I don't know. Okay, good enough. Um, okay, so William, um, I was hoping you could kind of take the lead here on this one. I know you've talked about it on your Twitch channel. Yeah, like three, four times actually. <laughs> um, so basically, it's forensic mycology. Mm -hmm. um, that's going to be the study of like fungi, if you will. Um, you got molds that can be included in that as well. And the thing is, it was brought up through the autopsy. You can see directly in there, it talks about mold being on two of the bodies, mm -hmm. not the third one. Well, we already know the, the, uh, the Kamel, whoever. I think it was Bruce something. He um he was the medical examiner on that one mm -hmm. on Kamel's body, and so he ended up doing the data and uh, the whole autopsy report quite a bit different than uh, David and Rinia's. So we know that there's that could play a factor in it. But um, as far as we know, there was mold with David and Rinia's bodies. With Rinia, for those that have seen the bodies, I'm obviously not going to show it. Obviously, I, I don't think you're going to either. Um, it's it's one of those things you can clearly see it on Rania. You don't see it on David. And I've looked and looked and looked and looked and looked. I have not. I I've scoured that photo. I cannot find anything on David at all when it comes to mold, which means it had to have been internal. Well, with Rania, it is external and internal. So, for me, that kind of struck something there. I'm like, well, why why is this mentioned? But nothing's done about it. So I started doing some digging. And I found several different reports showing that, yeah, it's not going to give you the exact time necessarily. It can. It can give you relatively close to it at least um, um, a time of death. But they have been using this for some time now. And there has been cases where forensic mycology actually is the, the reason they're able to go and put somebody behind bars. So, um, But basically, I just compiled some information here, as you guys can see on the screen, um, from three different reports. Um, there's the fungal growth uh, on a corpse, a case report. Uh, you can see right there. It plays a role in the determination of the time of death, burial place, and time of leaving the body where it was found, and cause of death, hallucination, and poisoning. Um, and forensic mycology is considered an auxiliary method in the determination of the time of death, just like forensic entomology, which is study of bugs. Uh, and then there's the other one, the fungal, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but fungal microbiota dynamics as a post-mortem investigation tool. Um, and they looked at three species of mycology, or of, um, what's it called? Uh, I'm not going to even use the Latin term, uh, like fungal and mold growth. And they did find that it can be used as a determination um, to kind of get the time of death. Um, at least somewhat close to it. Um, and then you've got, of course, the forensic mycology, current perspectives. Uh, it says determination of postmortem intervals for mold growth in corpses and providing trace evidence linking people and objects of places. So you can use it for a little extra than just time of death and all this, which is rather interesting, I found. So This stuff is um, so complicated to, to understand. Um, well, I mean, it's... For, for me. It is at first, first glance. I will give you that. It took me a second to kind of understand it. I'm like, okay, well, what is what exactly does this mean here? I went through the reports a few times, um, on some of them, I even like three, four times, because I was like really trying to understand where it was coming from. And But now that I, I've got it now, it just, it's kind of like, okay, that makes sense. But it's basically, can we determine time of death? You know, or at least a rough... Um, estimate, if you will, better than just kind of like, okay, uh, this body is here, we can assume based on this, this, or, you know, A, B, and C here, this is what, it, well, this just adds to the equation to further bring that time down. Mm -hmm. But this is going to be more accurate, especially after the body's been sitting there for a second, it's going to take time for mold growth, and, uh, and there's a lot of factors that can adjust it, too. Um, I know Catherine and I to uh, talked about it um, before the stream, you know, that there's some factors like you could have uh, health conditions that could cause it. You could have, um, you know, pre-mold growth or some kind of um, uh, fungal growth on the body. There's a lot of things that can, that can alter these things, but um, 
but yeah, it's it's one of those things that the police do use this. You know, uh, crime scene investigators actually do use this. It's really useful, and they did have a good amount of information on this after, well, even before the case even began, um, and they didn't use it, which I'm questioning why, because they do mention in the autopsy report, yet they do nothing about it. So, yeah. <laughs> Should I move to the next slide? Yes. Okay. All right, slide number two here. So now we're looking at David Crowley's autopsy report and Rania's autopsy. And this is where it mentions mold-like growth. Mold growth for David and then yes. mold-like growth for Rania, but none for Camille? Right, nothing at all there for Camille. Well, now we see this, it does directly say post-mortem mold growth for David. And it, I found it a little odd too because you can clearly see it on Rania's body, but you see post-mortem mold-like growth. Eh, this is where I was I was having some issues with it because I mean and you and I have talked about this um, when it came to the autopsy reports. There's a lot of things we were kind of going back and forth on. You know, whether it be we're with Camille where they say in there um, with the bullet wound, um, it was you know in the very top, and they start talking about um, trajectory. They say it was back to front, um, and then later on in that report they say front to back. So it's like, well, what is it, guys? But um, it, this is one of those things that I'm kind of like trying to figure out, okay, what exactly does mold-like growth mean when we can visibly see it, though, and we can see on the outside. And even then, one of the reports I was using, they, I, obviously, I went and redacted the thing for, for streaming purposes, but they did include pictures, and, I mean, those pictures they had reminded me of exactly what happened um, in that photo of the Crowleys, and we got to see Ornia. A lot of it looked just like that, which was really, really striking to me. And were so now these... we're going to see real world examples here of of other cases that, well, we're seeing the mold growth and we're seeing that this is, you know, they were able to determine all sorts of different things about this. Um, how long the body had been there, um, you know, where maybe this person had been prior to where they found the body. Um, things like that that can definitely play um, kind of a role in like, you know, did somebody kill this person or not? But we're also looking at time of death, too, which is the really interesting part. And with the amount of mold that's on the outside of Renina's body, plus she also had, quote, mold-like growth in the a liver and um, biliary system. Um, well, she had it inside and out. David only had it inside. So, you know, going over this, those reports even show. And for those that want to see it, I mean, I can always post up in chat, of course, but not. On Twitch, it's, yeah, but um, you can uh, you can see that those reports they even talk about that. It's usually you got most of the cases they found. There's going to be the in, internal growth because you got the decomposition going, and then of course it can go outward, and it generally does. But you've also got the ones where it does occur on the outside, which seems to be a little less frequent. But it does determine, and what's determined on that is basically what caused the death. You know, is this going to be a gunshot wound? Is this going to be a poison? Things like this. Then it's going to be more, uh, a lot of that's going to be internal, right? And then you're going to go to the outside. But that can also occur at the same time, they also found. So, but more often than not, it's usually internal. Um, but I, just to go and show a little perspective here, I did bring in some information from another case. Um, it's from 1996. Um, it was actually listed in the Forensic Mycology Current Perspectives, which was done in 2015. Um, and I'll just read it out real quick. It says, a young woman was found dead in a flat in West Yorkshire in January 1996. The forensic pathologist noted that there was some mummification and skin slippage, and it was necessary to determine how long the woman had been dead before her body was, had, was discovered. There were bluish green and gray mold colonies present, and the West Yorkshire Police Support Service took swabs from these and then measured the sizes of the bluish green colonies. Over a period of 28 days, an experienced medical mycologist um, studied the growth rates of the fungi on two artificial media at a temperature similar to those where the body was found, uh, which was at 4 degrees Celsius, and the, at room temperature, which is around 21 to 24 degrees Celsius. After comparing the growth rates, the mycologist concluded that death occurred at uh, a minimum of three to four weeks prior to January 16th, 1996, when the area of growth on the right cheek 
was measured. Hmm. So, um, <laughs> and on the next slide, um, sure. we go over the tests, and I do realize I put 20, it should have been 21, but roughly around that same temperature here um, we're hmm. looking at. And they did test, the little growth does occur um, at 39.2 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, which is 4 degrees Celsius. So we know that it can still grow there. It's just going to grow a little slower. But then test two, which is around the uh, Crowley residence thermostat at 68 degrees Fahrenheit, um, you can see that there it's it's growing. It grows pretty pretty quickly, actually, um, at that at rate. I didn't, of course, include the rates, which I do apologize. I should have included that. But five o'clock in the morning, just saying. <laughs> um, but interesting. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Interesting that you brought this up because Eric made a very valid point um, last year when we were talking about this case about why wasn't there any maggots in the around the bodies if it's if, too if, cold yeah if, if indeed if indeed that the bodies were there over a long substantial time period right mm -hmm. yeah and I talked to the corner about this and yeah as you look at the resident 68 degrees um, is is warm enough? We're talking outside temperature, though. There were no flies alive in Minnesota at that temperature. Right. We were looking into. Uh, you know, I, I know it's zero degrees in Michigan right now, but we still have uh, uh, fruit flies. Right. Uh, so. Well, and you see, I thought about that myself. Um, but the thing is, when it comes down, is they did have fruit in the house, which is interesting about that. But. Um, you know, I mean, like, I haven't seen a fly in my house, and, you know, we've had, you know, just, we've had fruit and vegetables up on the counter, and, you know, sometimes things go a little bad, you know, as we don't get to it in time. We haven't had any fruit flies or anything, and that's that's the really weird thing, and that's, that's over here in Oregon. You know, it's like 30 degrees, and we still don't, I, I haven't seen a fly. Yeah, and you have to remember, too, that just because you have little gnats or little fruit flies, those are not the same thing as a house fly. Mm -hmm. A house fly, and plus the, the life... Um, uh, expectancy of those little insects, but the reality is, is a, a fruit fly and a gnat were, are not going to lay maggots within dead flesh. A, a house fly will. So That's you're true. comparing apples to oranges. Well, but, but there is one com one fair comparison. So if a fruit fly, if we find fruit flies, we should be able to have house flies, because the fruit fly is going to die much faster in that type of temperature than a house fly would. So. We're looking at a lower temperature. Well, I, mean, I don't think that's true because a fruit fly may, it's going to need an, a source like fruit or whatever to survive, and that's where they grow and that's where they're born and all this other stuff. But a house fly, not, no, they're generally, um, not to say that they can't be grown or whatever hatch inside a house, but generally they're an outside insect that will come inside. Correct. Again, Correct. it's just, you're comparing apples to oranges, but it was just way too cold in Minnesota that time of year for a fly. So the fact that there aren't any maggots on the body, that really is understandable. Oh, yeah. No, it's absolutely understandable. Well, what he also brought up, the coroner, was the, um, the dog poop and the possible parasites. Um, right. And the dog poop that would have found their way over to the bodies, too. But, I mean, these, again, these are great points and, and learning a lot today, baby. Well, the back door was still left open. You can still smell yeah. it, wouldn't you, from the outside? If even yep. if you, even if you're in like six feet from that door, you'll still be able to smell it. Like there, there was supposed to be dog feeders around the place too. But who knows? I mean, mm -hmm. if if you already had COVID back then, your taste of smell would probably gone out the window. But who knows, man? I mean, I know here in Australia it does snow in winter in certain places. You still get flies here in Australia. Doesn't matter what freaking season it is. If it stinks to high heaven, you will attract flies. And if these bodies were in a decomposed state, you will attract something. Yeah, and not to go too far off topic, but real quick, I'd like you know compare that to when I first, you know, dog owners would not like to think that uh, the dog would eat them. They were uh, diseased for few days, but, you know, after doing more research on it, that's perfectly normal for the dogs to do that. Yeah, no, I'm that's... still shocked by that. Not perfectly normal for them not to turn to the bag of food. <laughs> Sitting right there, <laughs> the dog knows it gets fed. Um, but something to do with uh, emotionally and psychologically, the dogs do that out of, out of love. 
Um, yeah. They eat. They eat their owner out of love. I've done as hard as that was. Follow looking at my my dogs. You know, <laughs> I'm thinking of that. But they do do that. So you know, it, it's just it's great to go through um, the evidence here and throw out things that are there's too many points of contention, um, or there's might be misinformation. Um, and I'm glad that you guys go really in depth, like we're looking at right here. Um, you're bringing up something that I haven't seen. Um, with the mole growth, I mean, just just when I think I've seen thousands of pieces of evidence uh, contradicting the official narrative, here comes another piece. Mm -hmm. Well, Sorry, the thing is, when it when it comes to things like the dog and stuff, you got to remember too, they're claiming this dog ate a ton of flesh, a ton of bone, and you know, I mean, also I'm not, I'm not too. right, right, and it's just it doesn't make any sense because of. If you look at how long this dog would have been there, regardless of like the range, we're looking at least, you know, and we can even go with the police narrative and just say, okay, fine, we'll go whatever, like 26th or whatever, whatever they're saying. You can go up until then. He's not eating all of that bone and all that flesh. And then on top of that, licking up all that blood. And I would even argue some more decomp fluid too. I mean, I'm not buying that. It doesn't make any sense. The you thing know, go like. The dingo ate me baby. <laughs> <laughs> well, and how did the dog not get sick from the decaying flesh and stuff? Because an inside dog or you know, a, a domesticated dog is completely different right. than a wild animal. Bingo, there would have been puke everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, there's there no puke. Runny there? Poop. Well, yeah, yeah and there are. Know. I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to. to disappoint people but some domestic dogs can turn on people it all depends on the owner how right. they treat yeah. the dog right but um Absolutely. when it comes back to that the dingo ate my baby scenario that happened here in australia i mean did the dingo yeah. throw up well the court has now proved that yeah the dingo did actually do it now here's the thing Wild dogs like a dingo, they're like scavengers. If you've got food lying around, yeah, they'll come out of the woods and whatnot and they'll come for the hunt, right? And nine times out of ten, a, even a domestic dog can be, quote unquote, on the fence whether they attack young kids or not. Sure, you're talking, right? about, you're talking about ones that are alive, though, where, you know, the research I've done. Yeah. Their dad is actually quite normal for a dog. Like, uh, yeah, I mean, young kids have been has been attacked by um, domestic dogs all around Australia every single year. I'm not saying Parlo the dog was um, was a vicious animal, but like I said, it all comes back down to the owner how they treat that dog, and it, you know. It just goes to show that, you know, if, 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 right, let's just be conspiracy. No, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm a spoiler alert. Let's say for a height, let's say for hindsight, yeah, Paolo did do what many others knuckleheads say that he did, right? That he did eat the body and whatnot. That's quite, uh, after doing the research, that's quite normal. That means that it does love yeah. it, uh, believe it or right. not. I mean, if, if the dog's hungry, yeah, they're going to look for a food source, but they don't necessarily go for a human, right? They go for that dog, that dog food that was up against the counter. But if the dog was um, mishandled in anything, any shape or form before that, that's a possibility. I'm just saying dogs do do that. So if you talk about the dingo ate me baby, that can attack young kids. And remember, the baby was only a few months old when it got a, when it got attacked. So, yeah. Now the research I did actually showed that it shows the dog is showing love by doing that. Uh, regardless, um, hmm. the dog would have certainly torn into the bag of food also. <laughs> yeah, dog, yeah, yeah. dog, dog will eat anything. He eats his own poop. <laughs> That's so. It, right. it would have gotten into uh, that bag too. But yeah, it's actually, it sucked looking it up because, you know, again, looking at people out there who have pups, you couldn't imagine that, but it's actually a form of love um, oh. after, the, after the owners are deceased. I mean, for, for, for everything that the dog is credited with. I know. But, 
That is true. Yeah. For I, I would ask for everything that the dog is credited with eating, is that enough for three weeks? Is that enough to last him for, for three weeks? No, I see that's the thing. It's, I don't think it, it like I said, it doesn't add up. I mean all the way. Like I get where I get where we're coming from when it comes to um, you know, showing that affection, all this, but then you gotta look at okay, well, where did they test any of the poop? Did they see? And even then, we've we've talked to people too before that have that are you know they're dog owners. They're people that are they've got a lot of dogs, and they've also said when it comes down to it, you change their diet up, then all of a sudden now their poop changes. So it goes from being you know like just standard. That's not really weird, but a standard turd to um, then you get like this runny diuretic mess. Oh yeah, but it's uh, eating bodies, right? Exactly, and there was no diuretic mess anywhere. Well, in with in pi- what, 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 sorry, with with Palo, a inside dog more than an outside dog. I know. Okay, three bodies within the lounge room floor. The door was left. The back door was left ajar by a couple of inches. Well, he was an inside dog, right? Right, inside dog. But but was, uh, yeah, but. Uh, According to the, the according to the forensic photos, there was dog poop everywhere. So that tells me that Palo was more like an outside dog. Now, okay, if your dog is going to be locked up inside for three weeks, and they need to do a, a dump, they're just going to find any place to dump. Right? Mm-hmm. But was Palo more of an outside dog than an inside dog? That's a good question. I really don't know. Inside dog. I mean, I would definitely argue he's definitely more of an inside dog. Yeah, I, think um, so. I think he just had to go. He didn't have a way out. You know, he's not strong enough to go and move that um, the door open any further. You know, he's going to get in there to open it further. Oh, yeah, I, I didn't know that. Look at how many outside photos I have. But it, did they have an offense? If they don't, then it was definitely an inside dog. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, they didn't have an enclosure for him. Won't leave the yard, but most places, um, if you have an outside dog, you're going to also have a fence. That's mm-hmm. a good point. There's a chain link fence, I think, but I don't think it's all the way around the house, just certain parts. Uh, that's that's a great on, point. I think it's Judy's side, I want to say. It could be on the other side as well, but still, either way, end of the day, it wasn't, um, they didn't have an enclosed backyard. Okay, yeah, so it probably yeah. wasn't an outside mm-hmm. dog. Interesting. I never thought about that. That's a great point. Well, another I thing like... about the dog balls. Go for it. Yeah, yeah, so I'm not going to be real quick. The other thing that comes to my mind is if the dog was scared, which I presume it was, and that back door was left ajar open and you get that breeze coming in, the dog will find any way to try and open that door. I mean, Palo could have been going yep. for that door at any given moment and just put his paw. It was enough to open the door. It's slide it. I mean, Absolutely. Um, again, being a dog owner, uh, not to interrupt, but real quick, but I mean, we have an Australian Shepherd uh, Border Collie, which is a very intelligent, and our, our dog has gone around and opened three doors if we leave them unlocked. Yeah. <laughs> we'll open them, you know, with the handle. Um, so that's another good point right there. And that's a huge one, too, that crack right there. That dog would have found mm-hmm. a way out. Yeah. My so schnauzers used to open, open everything. Like, mini schnauzers will open the cage from the inside when it's locked. Mm hmm. That's a heavy door, though, isn't it? It's a pretty heavy door, I think. I can barely open my back door. This I, thought was on, I, thought, I, thought the, I thought the back door was on a slide. It is. Yeah, it is on a slide. So yeah, he so, could have just pressed his nose through there, wedged himself. Well, I mean, I mean I can, I can definitely our say dog so do does it all the time. Door, that's even hard for me to even open. <laughs> well, your dog is pretty crazy, um, Sophia. That's why. Well, this is true, too. <laughs> well, he's a mini Australian Shepherd, and like Eric was saying, they are so flippin' smart. Yeah, I guess because I am i don't own dogs, I don't really know anything ab- about dogs. Um, so when I look at my my rear rear slider, I'm like, this is heavy, though. It's I mean, I don't know how much there's there's weight, but that's it, I would think it would take a lot of a lot of weight. But again, that's just you know first first glance. Nah. Looking well, that's what I was trying well, to say. Know, is- because I have a slider on, mm-hmm. like over on my balcony, and I try to go and open that. I mean, it's that takes a lot of muscle just to even open it. Um, I know there's no way in hell. I don't know a single dog that would probably be able to even open that. Um, if a dog, if a dog is that frightened, they would do anything trying to get out of that um, danger zone. Right. Um, right. I will agree and, with you on that one. Right. Uh, I mean, I know this firsthand. Um, 
Shay and I, who's my fiance, we babysit her mother's dog once in a while. And when that dog gets scared, it will go straight to that back door and it will try and open that back door all the time. Yeah. And for Palo, it wouldn't have taken that much, even if you had an inch. If the door was opened by an inch, that's enough to get the front paw in the gap of the opening and just keep just whacking it to make it go open. If the dog is that frightened and it's scared, it will it will make that first move and then once that door is fully open, Palo would have just bolted to the hills or whatever. I, I still think that would come down to condition a door though. So we'd have to go and I, I'm all, I'll definitely want to take a look at that again. So when my tonight show, I'll definitely I'll bring that up because that's a, that's an interesting one. Well, I, there, there's another thing. Was there a fly screen on the back door, or was it just a door? If there, there was, was a screen. fly screen, if yeah. there was a fly screen in front of the door, well then, yeah, that's a different scenario. But if it was just a door that was left open, oh, the see. dog would have opened it. No matter no matter how severe it was, it would have opened it. Hmm. And Greg, just to let you know, the cat that was in the video that we did uh, for the podcast mm -hmm. that was sitting on the back of the rocking chair that I was sitting on, she can open my bedroom door. <laughs> and wow. it's a regular door. It's not a slider. Right. We have a, a doggy door, and uh, they told us our cats could get out. Our cats are dying, um, and they get out and out of it. And they could go right through the screen. They really want it. Yeah. Open door. Uh, uh, Ross, did you want to say something? <clears throat> I feel like you were going to ask something. Maybe not. Yeah, can you guys hear me? Uh, yeah. As far as the missing uh, water, water bowls, okay, now the internet, which will go unnamed, has told me this phenomenon that people don't use water bowls for their dogs and the dogs only drink out of the toilet. I myself... What? Did we lose you, Ross? Yeah, I'm, I'm back. My bad. I hit the power key. Okay. Uh, I've never heard of this phenomenon of pet dogs not using water bowls. Now, I've seen dogs drink out of the toilet and they had their owner yell at them like, yo, don't do that. Go drink out of your dog bowl before. But apparently to some genius comments that have been recently left, I'm sure you all saw, Pet dog pets don't use dog bowls, and they only drink out of uh, uh, toilet bowls. Does anybody like to clear that up for me, please, while I'm here? I'm sure in some places in Tennessee, <laughs> in the backwoods, in Kentucky, <laughs> that might be. That's yeah, it's hogwash. <laughs> I never heard that one. That's yeah. Uh, every dog I've ever known, yeah, they'll try to go drink from the toilet if they need water. If they want water that bad, but for the most part, they're just they're to stick to their their wa their water bowl or. If they, if they see that, uh, let's say, a kid's got a cup of water or something to drink on the table, they might go and take that. Yeah, I would think if... Yes, it, it, I, I would think if there's dog food, there must be a dog food bowl, and if there's a dog food bowl, there's probably a water yeah. bowl somewhere. Correct. Right. Yeah. So, so apparently those missing water bowls and food bowls are just not suspicious to, to any other people other, other than us. So uh, I, I thought I would clear that up. That's good. Well, yeah, how are they going to feed the dog if there's no bowl down there? Right. Are they just going to throw it on the ground and he peck it like a chicken? Yeah, yeah that's no. a good point. Hey, that's a good point. point. Yeah. He identifies as a chicken. Uh, just, just saying. <laughs> just let it, let it, let it rain. No offense to all dogs who identify as chickens. Yes. But uh, no, I mean we keep our toilet lid down because that's you know the cat loves to drink out of it or the dog will. Right. Uh, we have water fountains. We have three of them throughout the uh, the house, and then we also have the dog's water bowl and food bowl in one designated area. Right. So, you know, we just... I'd say that's the more normal one right there. Yeah. Uh, but but... Internet trolls, apparently that's not. So I have questions uh, about their, uh, their practices. It's weird. <laughs> well, you know, it's... My sister has a thing outside where, but she has a backyard for her animals. And in the, when she leaves her dogs outside, 
she has a faucet that has a drip on it. It right. is purposely done that way so the dogs can go over there and have fresh water at all times. Right. But we don't see that inside the house. So, you know, I, I don't know how they expected paleo to drink water or anything. Um, it would be good to look back at some of the, uh, the footage um, that was shot uh, prior to their deaths and, and see if, I think yeah. that's going to be a project, yep, because yeah. uh, we need to get an answer. Just like the dishwasher, there are several videos um, of them where they had the dishwasher open in the background. Mm -hmm. And so to me, I'm just assuming that's what they did. They just kept it open like that. Yep, once Which would drive me crazy. <laughs> yeah, it drive me crazy too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd be racking my shins on that every time I walked through there. So I get that. <clears throat> um, well, I'm gonna have to go, so I just want to say goodbye and thank you all for joining well, the show for today. Me. Thank you. Thanks, and, Sophia. Um, Appreciate it. I'll I'll continue listening. It's just we have. I have to run. So. Oh, no worries, no worries. You do you. I get you. <laughs> See you, Sophia. Okay. <laughs> Bye, everybody. <laughs> so the, you... old saying, the old saying go, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Well, in this case, you can lead a dog to water, but you can't make the dog drink. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair point, apparently. So I think but, um, just to uh, just just to wrap up on this um, this last um, screenshot here with the. Um, the whole mold thing, uh, William. This is pretty much what what you found here, huh? You, you think yes. that this really shows yes. the order of, of deaths? Yes, um, I'm. I mean, that's what I found. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure there will be those that disagree, and that's okay. It's okay. Um, this is what I had found directly from, I think, six different papers, uh, different reports. Um, that they were they were basically looking at this. So, but what we can see is due to Rania having the most mold growth, we could. We could see that it does appear that she has more mold growth, um, even though their autopsy report does say mold-like growth on it. That's hogwash, still as far as I'm concerned. Um, we can go and start determining some things. We know Rania um, must have died first, followed by David, and then ended with Kamel. And then the, um, the time of each death can be closely approximated based on growth data, but they never did any growth data. They never, they never gathered anything on that, so if they would have, they could have gotten a um, closely approximated um, time of death. But, so. Well, you know, and, and here's the thing um, I, with, with these bodies and, and this mold. Um, if you could point to me um, you, um, where on Rania's um, autopsy report where it states that she had mold growth on the outside, that would be great. I was trying to find it, and, and I was skimming over it. And... There's nothing in the, in the autopsy report stands on the outside. Okay, so, and that's kind of where I'm going with this. And you and I, like you had stated earlier, we talked about the mold growth on the inside. Um, and when you look at these reports that they had done, I was looking at the mycology of just mold and, and how fast it can grow and under what circumstances. But I couldn't find it necessarily with cadavers, like with what you found. So this is amazing. Thank you. Um, but they were stating, depending on the type of um, fungi that was being tested or found, it can grow as rapidly as 24 to 48 hours. It right. starts developing on the inside. Now, we know that the bodies were not there for three weeks. Why? Because their internal organs had not liquefied. That's one of the right. first things that happens. But yet, the mold can, and, and like we talked before, this part of the autopsy, it just... I always skimmed over it because mold does grow. It's just what it does. It's how the body decomposes. However, you're bringing a different angle to this. Like, um, could it have been used to help them understand that they were not there for three weeks? And you're right. They absolutely could have. Um, and also, like we talked about earlier, for me, what was a little more important was the stomach contents. Now, stomach contents absolutely tell them, you know, uh, um, about and, and like the order of death at that point we know Rania had undigested food particles 
right. along with the brown liquid. We know that Camille had a brown liquid. So that tells me that Rania and Camille ate the same food roughly about the same time. And then, um, but Rania had to have been killed first, right? Because yep. they have the same food thing, but not everything in little Rania's tummy had digested. And Camille's was more on the, it's going toward the digesting end. So that takes about roughly 40 minutes to an hour to start happening within the gut. So you can start to look at their stomach contents and see where the process of digestion is and then go, okay, from the last time they ate, they died approximately this time frame later. But yet David, not only did he not have any bile in his gallbladder and in his liver, but he was down from 160 something down to 128 that man had been starved but yet at the same time like you point out when you're looking at the rest of the autopsy and comparing the rest of the documents it really does appear that he did die before Kamel yes yes he absolutely did um, I just want to go and touch on a couple of things here so when it comes to the, the body weight I mean, they all they weighed was just what was left of them right there, which means there's going to be all sorts of things that could have been emptied, um, could have been, you know, obviously we didn't see any blood around the scene. It was really a whole lot of his. Didn't see any blood pools, nothing like this. Therefore, we could assume there's going to be blood that's gone. There's going to be body decomp fluid that's gone. There's going to be bone, muscle, skin. All this is gone. That could account, but that's also 40 pounds-ish or yeah, something like that. Yeah, it, it doesn't, really... yeah, exactly, you're right, and it doesn't account for it because everything is there. He had, they had not decomposed. Now, see, the, I mean, they were in the process of decomposing. Right. It's early, and in some cases, early to moderate. Um, so, and that's the thing that people have, they don't pay attention to. They hear the police writing in their reports, advanced decomp. So right away they're thinking, oh my goodness, there's nothing left. But when you're looking at the autopsy, the police don't have a freaking clue right. what, what a stage of decomp was. Right. And so right there, early to moderate. So, um, oh God, I forgot my point. I'm sorry. That's all good. Well, I mean, but that's, that's, that's a good point, though, is if you look at um, the bodies, there's different parts of them that are actually, like, there's parts that are skeletonizing, right? And then you got parts that are bloated still. And... No, if you're looking at the skeletonization aspect, um, true skeletonization only happens at the very, that is the very last stage of decomp. Now, when you have mummification that occurs, like in the hand and stuff, it can look and start to appear like skeletonization, but you can't base their entire um, uh, rate of decomp on that one factor. You have to look at the whole body. So we know that the hand is mummified, and we know that some of the bone may have started to go through, a.k.a. skeletonization. But you cannot at that point say, okay, his body's at advanced decomp. It's not, because you have to look at the rest of his body. I fully agree with you on that. That's why I just want to point that out is you have these parts that are going through different parts of, of not full, not the full body going through this whole um, skeletonization, obviously, but, you know, we're seeing parts of it. And the reason being is just because of different times throughout that, right? So we got bloating that's happening at one point. This is that's basically the big part. It looks like they're in the bloating phase. Well, um, and that's just it. You're right. And here's the thing that I disagree with with these um, autopsy reports because on the one photo you clearly see where bloating has started to begin. It has not gotten to the point where it's going to get when it comes to decomp. So right. it's only just starting again. And this is telling you the rate of decomp. They're about four, yeah, right there. There may be four to five days, seven days in of death right here. This photo, they're not that long dead here. And David's barely beginning to bloat at all. So, and that generally happens around day 10 and after day 10. Um, well, no, before 7 to 10, I think day 7 to 10 is when the bloat begins. But, um, oh my God, I feel like a retard. I just totally lost my train of thought. Yeah, but what you, not at all. I feel like I'm on an episode of Forensic Files. What <laughs> 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 yeah. on there uh, presenting this case, I don't know, but you're killing it. Thanks for teaching me a lot. I'm learning a lot today. <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> and, and you can you know, have thought really easy staring at uh, dead bodies. <laughs> so. Well, I mean, yeah. I was in the medical field for a long time, and I had friends, and I've been to autopsies, and I've seen decomps in different stages. So I have a little bit better understanding than maybe the average person might, but nowhere near what a real true professional would. But yet I can see this. and um, But the fact that 
like I think where um, William was going is that David had a 40 pound weight loss between what he's talking in his journal just before the deaths to where right. he's um, weighed at the time of the autopsy then there's a 40 pound difference and the fact that, yes, he's missing blood, yes, he's missing some of his head or most of his head, but that definitely does not account for the 40 pounds missing. So what happened to that man prior to his death? Right. And I, like I said, my, my thought on this, just my initial speculation on this is, I, I mean, I don't think he was necessarily starved or anything like this, but I do think 40 pounds is a lot of weight. I mean... You know, I, I mean, I do think that it could account for how much he had lost from his body. A lot of it could be, but yeah. at the same time, we, we you know, I, I can't do this right off the top of my head. You know, is this going to be how much he would lost? We'd have to look at the percentage of his body loss. There's a lot of different things. We could get some kind of rough estimate about how much weight he lost. Um, well, you know, we could, we could break out the equations. We could do it. Well, I, I, I mean, think about it, yeah, but think about it this way, though. When you see a loved one who's passed away and then they go and then, you know, you have an open casket and you see them, have they lost 40 pounds between the time they died and you see them in the casket? The body does not lose mass like that. It does not happen. And well, no, the fact it's, that it's he's a missing... It's a, it's a yeah, shape, it's solid. I'm sorry? It's a solid shape still, so it's still it's going to well, take time. And so were their bodies. Their bodies were yeah. solid shapes. Look at that. And the fact up. that he's missing, he has no urine in his bladder. He has no sure. contents in his stomach. He has no bile in his liver and his gallbladder. That tells you he had not been eating prior to death for a period of time. And now he's there's a 40-pound difference. So my question, and I'm looking at this, and then I start to go, what happened to these people? What happened to him? What happened to Kamel? What happened to Rania? Um, and in in all things that I see, and with as horrible as it may sound, I think Rania had the most merciful of the deaths out of all of them. If you want to call it that way, that's still horrible. But Kamel suffered greatly as well as did David. I think she watched both of them die. Actually, I think that's yeah. what happened. I'd like to make a. I'd like to ask you guys something about this 40, 40 pound difference. Um, first, uh, first thing I, I think we that I would want to see is what is the last known photograph of of, of David, um, because I can tell you that on my driver's license, what it said on my license is not what I really weigh now. You know what I mean? Right. So um, I would I would wonder about that. Um, how much did he really weigh in in December? of 2014 and was it was it uh i don't think we'll ever know really but nobody nobody who saw david ever made any um well i guess you know there were two people that said that he looked that he had lost a lot of 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 weight and that would they would probably need that they probably that would they would need to believe that in order to believe what what we're reading here right be, so that way it wouldn't be such a big 40 pound difference Okay, but you okay? Take a take. You have to take the whole thing in, into into your view. Um, now we go by his journal, and I wish I could remember, but I know it was like kind of toward the end where David writes he had finally. He's I'm quoting him. Finally got down to 168. Mm -hmm. He oh. was super excited. He got down to because he'd been working out, eating healthy. And he's doing all this great stuff. Now, to imagine a 40 pound, how tall was he? 5'9, 5'10, 5'11? How tall was he? Almost, you know? six, almost six feet. I think five okay. kilograms. Okay, so that's a pretty good sized man. Now, imagine him at 128 pounds. He would be virtually a skeleton, super skinny and yeah. unhealthy. So that is not the David we see. Um, and again, we you got to let. It's a massive weight loss. That's not something little. And yes, our driver's licenses, let's face it, may say, oh yeah, I was 140 when you're actually 155 now. That type of thing going on. However, to look at, if there's one of you guys right now that's close to David's height, and whatever your weight is, imagine you down to 128. That is beyond anorexic. That's like walking skin and bones. Right. I'm just playing a devil advocate. Could it be possible that the bodies that they found is not actually theirs, it's somebody else? We'd, have, sure. to, we'd, have, 
look at how they how are the bodies identified go ahead eric see i i don't believe so i think those are those are definitely their bodies yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah i'm i'm sure. i'm saying they are i'm saying they are them but just just a little bit of doubt in the people's mind i mean okay so how so how quickly did david supposedly lose 40 pounds yeah, and that's just it. We don't know. There's really, I mean, if you think about it, how how is that truly possible in the scheme of things, in reality? How would in, one lose 40 pounds in, quickly? In six, in six months, because as you guys know, uh, I'm on a shorter time I'm, six I'm, In six months, I've been on a diet, right? Well, seven months now, I've been on, on a diet now. Yeah, I'm around the same height as David Crowley. I lost about 60 pounds in six months. No, 60 pounds in six months. Now, 40 pounds depends what type of diet David was. He can probably lose that in half the time that I lost 60 pounds. Well, you're looking at body weight, body mass, body fat, BMI, all of that. And David didn't really have that to lose. Now, that's... No, no, yeah, yeah. What I'm doing, and mine's not actually fat. Mine is just like the solid muscle, right? No, I'm saying, uh, it, I'm not yeah. talking about you in general, I'm talking about uh, you personally, I'm talking about in general terms. When you're looking at, if you're going to do a massive weight loss like that, you have to have that body mass to lose. Otherwise, yeah, yeah. you're not losing. Unless, well, it's not like David Crowley was trying to go up boxing or UFC, because when they train, when the UFC fighters, they cut weight on a rapid scale. Mm-hmm. David sure wasn't in that David, life, make, like yeah. Adam Anza look like a bodybuilder. <laughs> that's how. That's how. I understand what you're saying with the with the body law. I mean, yeah. that's, that's, well, like, do we know? It wasn't know like what? it wasn't like David was preparing to go for a fight because when you do go, like when you train for a fight, you do cut weight on a rapid scale. David Crowley wasn't going for a fight. He was still eating like Smash Smashburger and stuff like that too. But right. do was, we know when? Life. You know, well, but... and, yeah, and not only that, again, you, if you're comparing apples to apples or apples, you know, these guys who may have to cut weight, how big are they to begin with? What do they look like? What is their yeah. body mass? You don't, have, you, yeah, you don't have to be that big to cut weight. You don't really have to, like, in a competitive nature... You have to be at a certain weight to compete in that. Right. Like, like, yes, I, I get that because there are different levels. However, if you in and in reality, you can't have say like a I don't know I don't know the terminology, but you can have someone in a weight category of say 180 pounds, and you know they're like trying to compete. Now they're 180, but they want to go compete in the 140 weight thing. And, they, okay, can't, they, they, they can't do that. They can't exactly. Do that. That's what I'm trying to say here. And this is kind of how it is with David. He he had, uh, in his words, he had worked himself out and had eaten healthy and gotten down to 168. But yet on autopsy, he's 128. And this didn't even sound of an alarm bell. But to just really jump in here, uh, being in the field as managing professional boxers and amateur boxers and then the weight loss thing um, when you're talking about David being healthy um, that means he was gaining muscle mass which weighs 10 times more than fat mass so mm -hmm. when you start cutting weight you're cutting fat which is um, very different thing so spot up mm -hmm. one of these with you guys um, on a handy soak at some point um, you just have to use code words that's how you get around it <laughs> yeah. we'll talk about this uh, at incident like Latamanza <laughs> and handy soak I would love to, just to get your analysis, um, your medical analysis too. This is awesome. On on what? No, I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, I need to I'd love to do a show um, with you and the rest of the panel and Greg and Jamie. Yeah. But um, Catherine, yeah. just because I knew from a um, yeah. the background, which um, makes it credible. I would love to do it. I'm just about any type of uh, false flags, oh, folks, yeah. whatever, oh, well, whatever it may be with you, be awesome. Be I want to bring up. I want to bring up this point because this this is probably will open up a different angle. Now I know if you're a healthy man, like I was back in 2000 before I went into rehab for drugs, you do lose 
that matter white when you when you are impacted on drugs. Now the drugs that I'm talking about is crystal meth, ice, speed, and that because you don't eat, right? Those are what you call uppers. When you're on an upper, you don't want to eat anything. You just want to drink to keep that that rush keep going, right? I know this per firsthand because I was taking drugs back in 2000 like a champion, right? You don't want to eat. When you're on an upper, you do not, and you lose a truckload of weight. And you're not even doing push-ups. You're not even doing any of that. You're just not eating, and all you are taking into your body is drugs. Now, I'm not saying David did this because it's not in his, in his report, right? But to lose that amount of weight in a short period of time, you have to be a full blind junkie. Well, and there's legal drugs um, like the ones you're you're talking about too. Um, working all those hours and such, was he taking something like Adderall? That'd be another. No, he wasn't. His socks was completely clean. Mm -hmm. You're yeah. looking at it right there. Um, if you go back up or wherever you were, there we are, right there. His toxicology. It is a clean tox yep. report. Um, so there were no drugs taken. There was nothing he was doing to try to lose weight quickly. He wasn't a drug addict. He wasn't any of those things. And again, this is what, this is why you have to look at the scene and look at what the evidence is telling you, and then back it out and say, okay, what could have led that? We know it's not drugs. We know he's not, you know, doing just some massive training because, like um, um, Eric was saying, he would have been bulking up. So what? Then it, you you start doing process of elimination. What does that leave? You're well, not eating. No, no, well, not that, well, it just tells me. I'll, I'll I'll just say it again. On the autopsy report, that's not David's body. But it is his body. It is. That yeah yeah. yeah I get what you're saying, but <laughs> with the report they came out with, that is not David's body. That doesn't make any sense. I mean, it does, yeah, it does make sense. It does no. make sense. If, if, if we all agree that, right, this, 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 if, if, this, if, if this, 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 and this does not add up, and how possibly can he lose 40 pounds of weight, right, and the photo doesn't show that he's lost 40 pounds of weight, then that report that they made is not David's report. Now, you guys are sure that's his body. Um, tell me about that. Like, what makes you... I mean, it is possible that it wasn't his body. I mean, it is possible they could have stayed his body, right? That's what we, I'm getting at. We would, we would have to look at yeah. what they know about this. Is it the that problem? is something... I mean, I... When we're, when we're getting the actual, like, photos, I don't know if you guys have seen the medical examiner's photos of the bodies and what they'd found, like, the clothes and all this, they do show off the bodies. And we're talking even tattoos with skin slippage and all this kind of stuff. So, I mean, okay. I'm, I am I mean, I can't say with 110% certainty, right, that it's impossible, right? But I can say with like a 99.9% .9 certainty that those are their bodies. Yeah, and, because the tattoos, me, those go down pretty I want to add this, too, because this is important. There's one photo of them, and it, when you look at it, and you um, clean up the photo the best it can be cleaned up, you can still see the jawline of David. And you compare that with the photos of who he is, and it matches. Yeah. That jawline looks exactly like David's jawline. So, and then, then you match up the, the, um, the tattoos as well. And yes, can those be faked and put on? Yes, you can fake a tattoo. But, you know, everything that that is showing here says that these are their bodies. Sure. It's well, what I'm trying to say what I'm trying to say is compared to the photo to the autocopy, it's different. Bingo, right there. Right? If if we just focusing on the autocopy and not on the photograph that we've got, that autocopy Compared to the photograph, that was, it's not David's body on the autopsy report. Well, I don't see how you can say that because I see it as the same. I see that it does match up. So I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll do it. Well, well, okay, look, look at the photo. Look at the dead body photo compared to the autopsy report. You can tell, we all agree, that he had not lost 40 pounds of weight. No, well, you, no you can't. 
right there. What? Well, no, hold on, Jamie. That kind of right there, he looks like he's very thin, but you have to look at this photo right here, and the body is beginning to bloat. So it's going to look bigger than what it actually is. Right. Do we have side by side? Can we, is there a way to share side by side photos of, of the autopsy and, and previous to that? This is interesting. Yeah. And more, more rabbit holes <laughs> to go down here. Yeah, we do have all of those photos. How um, sloppy this case was, I mean, the, how sloppy they were with a lot of the things. Um, to have that type of accuracy, um, majority of the autopsy reports, um, it, it's highly doubtable that it was a different, different body. Yeah, I mean, we have to look at how, how do they I, I, identify David here. Um, and so they, they go through that by dental, dent, dental records and by the tats, right? And then if you compare that to the, to the photos here, you can see that those are, are the same tats that, that, that David had. Correct. So those, those are, are like those tats. I was talking about if, did you have side-by-side -side photos, Jamie, that, that shows a difference in the autopsy versus before? Who, me? Yeah, yeah. Cause I, I, don't, I don't have any of this stuff. No. Okay. I'm just saying by what thing what being said, like in reading on the website that uh, it's on the grave state, we all question, like, how can this be possible? How can that be possible? I'm just playing the devil advocate, right? Well, sure. Anything's I'm playing, right? I, I'm saying it for myself. This is my opinion. I don't believe that autopsy is a legit autopsy. They may say it is. They may say it is. But manipulation being in play here. That is not a that is not a legit freaking autopsy on David Crowley in my standpoint. And I folk listen, I mentioned at the in the today show, I look at these cases here in South Australia, which I still talked about today, that happened many, many years ago. Right? I know these photos about the tattoos and that that's how they got that. But if you go on the autopsy report, not the photos, just what they mention, it does not look legit to what actually happened on the time they saw the body. Do we know when they say, Catherine, do you, do you know when it, when, what date David wrote that about getting down to 168? That's, I'm, I'm trying to remember, and, and I know it was either toward the middle or toward the end of his journal. William, do you remember reading that? I'm looking for it right now. Okay. okay. Yeah, I'm not, yeah. I'm not I, I would have to. I'd have to take the time and, and look it up and find it because, yeah, I think that that does m mean something. So I, I think you're onto something, Greg. Yeah, I'd like to. I'd like to know exactly when when he was saying that. Um, that's curious. Very curious stuff there. Well, um, the they, down, I'm going to try and run the equation tonight and get it all figured out. What, is it possible that forty that forty pounds could have been from his that portion of his head that was gone, no. um, you know, plus blood, and then and a good portion of decomp fluid. There's, I mean, it's a possibility. I would definitely say that it's. Uh, I would say the it's head pretty averages likely. roughly the whole head in itself totally wrap, um, averages around eight pounds, eight to nine pounds. Well, yeah. um, blood itself, the full volume might be a pound or two. Um, and as far as decompositional fluid, that um, wouldn't even come into play because that's what's created as the body decomposes and breaks down. It turns from a solid into a liquid. So that wouldn't even be part of it. So you're just really looking at the missing of the, the head, a hand, and the blood, which would not equal 40 pounds. So where, where well, are they well, getting the this? Blood, I mean, that's the thing. How much blood do we know is in the body still? They well, didn't they find any. I mean, well, there's well, the lividity and is not there. If there's no lividity, there's no blood in that body, unless they had them on a constant whatever. You know, you're constantly flipping them all the time. But yeah. So I don't understand where they're getting this whole three three week theory from. It's not in uh, the Reeve ports here, right? But obviously, um, so what? I mean, what makes them think that they were there for three weeks? It, it should be based on David's autopsy right correct but it seems to be that what they're doing is they're basing it on the last time they were either heard from or, yeah basically last time they were heard from or seen 
And that, to me, is not, that just doesn't make sense, because you have to go by the body decomp status. They, it was so easy, like um, William was pointing out, it is so easy for them to, to get a really good timeline, but they didn't. Yeah, if it's early to, to moderate, moderate decomp, um, I mean, e everything that they're putting in here, I would think, okay, well, they say, oh, well, based on this, yeah, based on it's what we're seeing here. It's a few days, yeah. When you look up any definition of early decomp, it's the first several days, three, four days. So when, that, when you have an ME stating early to moderate decomp, you're looking at maybe four to 10 days, four to 11 days, which is exactly what the um, ME said that I interviewed. He's like, no, those bodies are, I would, he said four to seven days, and then he said 10 days at most is what he would place those bodies being dead at. So, but yeah, and, and when you're looking at these autopsy reports, they are saying the same thing. They are basically um, just uh, um, reiterating what this other Emmy that I talked to, because they state early to moderate decomp is evidenced. That's crazy. It's crazy that the police would just kind of dis discount this. Yes. Um, yeah, I want to. I want to know if it was the BCA or the ABPD. But I guess yeah, probably the ABPD. But like you say, it's based on you know his last known um, uh, act activity online, et cetera, et cetera. But man, I would think it should be based on the actual autopsies. Right. So. It, it really should be. And that's why I, I say I, I wonder what happened to them prior to their deaths because they were last seen or heard from actually it was weeks before their body was found. And so with his massive weight loss, he's not being heard from. Um, we know that he was um, beaten about the head. So we know he's not the guilty party. So, I mean, it's brutal. It, it's an extremely violent scene. I mean, just I mean, just alone, what I've already calculated out, just based on averages, okay? Human body, we know there's no blood, so that's a good portion of the weight. I've already got it down to 130.4896. I'm doing that live right now. And I got it down to 130.4896 for the weight. We go from 168 all the way down, and that's just based on average averages, okay? I'm not even going off of his, like, the exacts yet. So what are they just, saying the blood weighs? Blood, let me get that. You have six liters of blood, and that does not weigh that much. Uh, okay, adult will approximately have, and this is according to redclossblood.org, okay, uh, adult will approximately um, have 1.2 to 1.5 gallons, or 10 units, of blood in their body. Blood six is approximately 10% of the adult's weight. Okay, but that's what it's saying on the Red, Claw, Red Cross, right? They're saying it's 10% approximately of the adult's weight. So we know that's going to be, what, 16.8? Uh, so that's going to be, that's a good portion of the weight right there. That's getting dropped. So I'll just go do this in real time right now. Just one second. 168 uh, times 0.1, okay? If you get our percentage, it's going to be 16.8. Subtract 16.8. That drops us to 151.2. Okay, now we got the average human head we got to worry about now because we know that's going to be losing. So you're going to be, on average, average human is going to be 11 pounds. Okay. No. no okay, that's again, not. Five. That's what it says right here. But that's you have to remember, the, his whole head was not missing, only portions of it. There was still part sure. of his head. I'm, ju I'm just going off general averages right now. I'm not even doing the exacts. That's what I'm saying. Tonight, I'll do the exacts. But right now, I can get it down to 130-something right now. So... If I can get it down to that, plus there was other things that could have been included, I'd say it's fair. Yeah, that's his body right there. That's all I'm trying to say here. We can get the weight down just based on averages, not even on the exact. We are, we're not even getting the exact amount. Because we can go and calculate percentage of his head that was taken. We can, we can do that. We can do the hand, how much of that was taken, you know, up into the forearm and all that. So we can, go and, we can get percentages on this. We can calculate that out. Plus, if we know that he's missing all of his blood, right, then we can go and just go and we can just go and do the simple math there, and we can break it down. That's his body. Oh, I agree with you. That definitely is his body. Like I said, I'm not trying to disagree with you. I'm actually agreeing with you. Oh no, no, I'm no. Just, no. I'm just trying to show Jamie out that yeah, this is this is his body. Right. This totally. Is. She went with the cover. The curious thing we have to remember is, and again, this is what I. Oh, sometimes I just feel like I'm beating my head against a wall with some, not you guys, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about others here, you know, is you have an empty bladder, you have an empty stomach, 
you have no bile. That right. is telling you he has not eaten, he has not drunk anything for a while before he died. And, and this is kind of what I'm trying to stress. What did that poor man go through? When you say a while, like how long? A, a day? Two days? Exactly. That, that's that's going to be the part that's going to be hard to determine. Yeah, because exactly. What Will said, it would be hard to say, but it would be out. It would be at least twelve, maybe twelve to twenty-four hours, 20, 24 to forty-eight hours. Uh, technically, digestion can go right through the stomach in forty minutes, all the way up to one hundred and twenty plus minutes, uh, based on what I had found. And I'm just doing quick Google searches on this. I'm not even going into the text or any of this kind of stuff. I'm just going on this. And what is the average time? Okay, if you eat something, it takes roughly 40 minutes to an hour to go from the stomach down to the duodenum into the small intestine. And then from there, there are a few hours to go from the small intestine into the large intestine and then out the anals. I mean, yes, it, within probably eight but this Five to does, eight hours, but that's not what I'm mean. missing my point. Well, 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 there's no, not even that, any, there's no urine. Well, no, has, I agree. I agree, but that means he hasn't necessarily drank anything in a bit. He hasn't drank anything, and he didn't eat anything because they're, you know, and and that's another thing too, which, um, like, I want to bring up a point that Jamie says in the fault of these autopsy reports, because with most autopsy reports, they will state if there is um, some type of food or um, feces, I should say, within the um, the large intestine or the small intestine. And they don't even mention that because, again, that too would let them know roughly how long it had been, you know, from the time he ate until the time of death. There are so many indicators that they could have used to get a time of death for this family, and they didn't use any of them. That's so weird. That's so uh, The other thing is also this exact report on this, uh, the whole... Uh, how this is all designed, I actually got a copy of it. Um, it's They literally use a um, a template to go through these things. That's why I'm curious about uh, the guy who did Kamel's, because it's, he did his own, basically. Was this Wayne Carver by chance? <laughs> well, Hopefully not. No. <laughs> well, I totally missed it. Uh, I could... <laughs> go ahead. That's all good. Um, but, you know, I actually got the... I ended up finding their exact template that was used. Um, it's still being used. Are you kidding me? No. Um, hang on one second. I'll bring it up. Um, let me see where did I put it. Medical examiner photos. Here it is. <laughs> I can bring it up in here. This well, I will tell you, with, uh, with all, I've read a lot of autopsy reports. Well over 100 I've read. Real autopsy reports from you know, the with and the, this uh, one, these the, these autopsy reports are by far the worst I've ever read. Yeah, that's what I'm, that's what I'm saying, Catherine. Uh, I'm just basing my opinion on the autocopy report. That what they did does not look like that with David Crowley's body. But you know what I mean? From the pictures, I, it looks it looks uh, it looks like him. Hang on, I'm just saving. I'm not the, saying uh, that it's not David. They got into Word document, so autocopy. and literally did not make it. Pulled it directly from their site. Wade's so. gone, by the way, folks. Yeah. Yeah, no. Is he? Is he really? Interesting. Yeah. Dum, dum, dum. yeah, people don't know Wayne Wayne Carver. Look up look up Coroner Wayne Carver. We see what Eric's talking about. Oh. In code. Oh. So I don't get banned. Seven percent of body weight. What's that? Oh, the blood. Oh, the blood of a human body. Seven percent. Hang on one sec, I'll get this pulled up. It's, it's literally, this is titled, and this is from their website. It would say, a conference that Lelinsky's, I was looking her up earlier. What is she, like, basically, you know, is she still doing this type of thing? Oh, it certainly seems to be. Um, but she's uh, she's definitely moved up in the world as she's now um, doing conferences and stuff like this. So I went and I found a website that, you know, that's this, um, this conference she was at. Um, and all the information they were handing out and all this at their little conference or little speaking event and I was able to uh, get this pulled so it's five pages long and I'm just going to make sure I've got it saved in the right area there it is perfect okay all right pulling it up right now um, I'll send it over to Greg as well so that way if he wants to go and pull it real quick I wanted to get out one of these for so long I listened Glad to be on here. Notes. Yeah, well, you're really, really good, and I'm sorry I'm going to blow smoke up your butt here for a second, but you're super good at these um, 
uh, like these spreadsheets and everything. So if you really do get it worked out on a thing where you know taking out the volume and everything, could you please send that to me so I can get a better understanding of what you're saying? Sure, sure. I was planning on just putting together. I was most likely going to be doing it live tonight. So, but uh, yeah, I can. Uh, I'll, I'll send it to you. Yeah, because I'm I'm doing this at the seven percent because it was saying seven percent, and then I'm averaging what his head probably was like, and I'm now like at one forty eight pounds. But my math is not good, and I will tell you that my math is really not that good. So I'm going to trust your math over my math any day. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I I still tell people you know do your own research on it. So no matter what I say, you know I'm just like yeah, just you know at to some degree take it with with a grain of salt, do the research on it. So, but, but yeah, I get what you're saying, but that's fine. Uh, one sec, report, here we go. And this is it coming at you right now, Greg. And you're sending that to where? Like any second now. To my Gmail? Yeah, the gray stage one. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, open that up. There you go. You know, this and I did it. send an email to Dr. Lelinsky, and she never wrote me back. Oh, I would expect that from her. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm not. I'm giving her a call. I'm, I'm like, hey. <laughs> Uh, can we can we talk about this for a second? Because uh, I'm curious as to what you know what exactly you include in this report. But I, I mean, if I'm being honest, I don't think she's going to necessarily have access to reports necessarily either anymore. That's true. So um, you know, us basically, we can always send her one, and then hey, can you kind of tell us what you mean by this? See if that jogs her memory. I don't I, honestly, I don't think she probably even cares at this point. It was just a job, get it done, you know, and then get it out of the yeah. way. Yeah, Probably she was, was right out of medical school. She hadn't been a, an ME for like maybe a, a year or so. So she right. truly was new when this case came about. Yeah. Oh, oh no, you're kidding me. <gasps> Generic autopsy what? report. What? <clears throat> you are not kidding, are you? No. Nope. And this is not the, the template that I have seen with other autopsy reports, I will tell you that. Holy cow. Right? Identification, generally comparison of antemortem and postmortem. That's my point. See, so it's like that they've got a template they're doing. Is all they're doing, which that's lazy as hell, but whatever. A well developed, um, well nursed things very, very orderly. That's crazy. You know, but it's one of those things that yeah, as when I saw this, I was just like, wait a second, I had to go and compare. <laughs> I was like, okay. Well, you were right. It's like right they did, they just plugged in the information. Oh, is, my is, all show it is that not normal that now. they do that? I've never seen one like I mean, that. I, see, I would say that it would make sense to have something like this, but at the same time, everybody should be following it. But even then, this thing should be extensive to the point where it covers everything, or at least a good portion of what you'd find through an autopsy. You know, is it this? Is, it that? You know, is this occurring? Is this occurring? What? You know, all this. Just going through all the details we need and... Well, I guess Hennepin County's got something going good for him, I guess. But wow, I don't know it's different with pretty much every single one I've seen too. So, but and here's this is why I don't think that they should do this because hold on, just stop and let's just read something. Sure. Go go back up. Yeah. The, okay. Sure. Gastrointestinal or yeah, right up there. Um, yeah, the pelvis are unremarkable and ureters are normal and coarse in caliber. White bladder mucosa, ovularies, and intact bladder wall. The bladder contains approximately blood. Now, it, oh, even, can you go up just a little bit more sure. to the one just above that? Right there. Okay, the right and left kidneys weigh blank, blank, blank. The cut surfaces are red tan and congested with uniformly thick cortices and sharp corticomensulary junctions. Now, this, how could that be a standard thing it, depending on the type of body that you have? Now, if you have a super decomposed body, you're not going to be seeing any sharp corticomedullary junctions. Well, and the thing is, what this is there for is just basically, it's just cut and dry. They can, adju they can adjust these things. I mean, but, but that's my doctor. point, is that it would have to be adjusted with every single autopsy, so I don't see how they're using this. If well, what, using what I'm getting at is, like, you look at their categories they have. Okay, so for instance, they have things like, and then internal, they have head, neck, body cavities, respiratory system, cardiovascular system, you know, liver and all this. And you just keep going through these categories. So they had this in every single one of them, which they didn't. If you looked at, if you look at Kamel's, they didn't have every single one of these on there. Right. If you were to look and compare the, the whole setup of the reports, Kamel's was the one that was off. It's way different. 
they didn't have their own system set up for it or that this guy was using. He just literally just, it almost looked like he just kind of wrote it on himself. You know, or he didn't do some of these tests, so he just didn't include it. But they should at least be, it should be noted at least in there, oh, did not test this or didn't test this or, you know, things like this. That way they're going through so they can just adjust each of these categories is how they should have it. Um, so that way they know, okay, did I need to go check the pancreas? Did I need to check the adrenals? Uh, things like this. The adrenals. Yeah, I mean, tomato, tomato. Um, but, <laughs> but it's one of those things. It's, it's are you going to, you know, use a template like this or are you going to just, you know, just kind of just off the top of your head, this is what I tested and this is everything else. But then you get two medical examiners. Now, things don't necessarily add up because now, well, did you not test this or did you... Well, they generally it. will record as they're doing the autopsy. And right. then, uh, you know, so they're talking as they're doing this. So the fact that there's no, <laughs> these guys have been doing this for so long, there's no need to, to have a template per se. And I'm looking, again, I'm looking at this template and it's disturbing to me that, because there's so much information that they will lose and or not include that might be important. Correct, correct. And that's something, like I said, I agree with. I think there needs, I mean, personally, I think the template's nice is it makes the job easier. So they're just trying to get everything on the fast track as much as possible instead of having to sit there for however long. It's like me, I'm not necessarily the fastest typer, right? But I can type at a decent pace. Um, when I really get going, I'm two-handed, but for the most part, I'm like one, two fingers, you know, just you know, just kind of have to go and get into it. Well, not everybody can, you know, even even young kids that are younger than me that are, getting into this, I mean, some of them, they don't type very fast either. You know, then there's people that that's what they do for a living. You know, they, they're, um, yeah, I, I had a, I did a, a business that did this, that, that did medical legal transcription. Sure. So th that's what I'm getting at. So, so it's like, you're, you're going to probably be a faster typer than I am. Um, so having something like this, this is going to go and expedite things a little bit more because now I don't have to go through and lay everything out that I, you know, for every single one of these. It's just, bam, here's your template, type it in. So this it's, <laughs> we're, we're, we're okay. And, and Okay, and this is, what, from experience, I'm telling you this is not useful. This would be a pain in the ass because then you'd have to stop and, and fill in blanks instead of just typing out what's dictated by the doctor during the autopsy. That is so much easier. You have this in your ears, you're just typing away. This one you have to stop and plug, stop and plug, stop and plug. So it's a pain in the ass. Well, and that's, a, I mean, it could be, but at the same time, things like from other... But, but think about it from this perspective. At the same time, if there's like he doesn't cover this, you just go on to the next the next section. You could you don't even have to stop and type. You just go on to the next section. You can always go back to that. No, and okay. The, you, the, you, you clearly have not done this job. I'm telling you, doing a template like this is not helpful for a typist mm -hmm. who transcribes this medical information. It's just better to listen to what they're saying and you fill it in and you type it out as they go because they'll go, okay, now we're into the gastrointestinal system. You do that and then you type out every word they say. Now heart, you type in everything they say. It's just so much faster that way than to do a template. Uh, template's not even rationally valid. <laughs> Basically, right. it makes no sense. Right. However. All right, well. I mean, I think it's right. I think it makes sense because I know I like to have templates so we can just quickly just do something. Well, okay, then try it. I, I, and I'm not being, I'm, I know I'm not being confrontational, but I am telling you, unless you actually do this, there's, it may seem like it's a good idea, but if you're the one who's typing this out, and if you had to stop and fill in stuff like this, it would take up 10 times the amount of time. And you've done this. I did it. This was my business. I did it for five years. Well, would this be more more um, useful for um, maybe for um, uh, training purposes than anything else? Uh, the only thing I can think of why they would do this is so that maybe someone could get a general idea of what it would look like when it's complete, but not something that I would take and fill in. I mean, the main thing that sticks out to me is still that the date and hour of, of death. It's like that's that's what they're they're supposed to determine that, right? That's what right. this is supposed to, to do. And and when you look at for, for David and for everybody else, they just say, oh, they were found on 117. Well, who cares when they were found? Well, if okay. And let me explain that to you because generally why they do that, and this is why they're considered to have died on January 17th because if they don't have a solid and they don't know for sure, like say if you saw someone 
like, you know, when somebody's out there being chased by the cops, they're breaking the law, they get shot and they killed. You know exactly the moment they died. Right. But in cases like this, they go on the date that they are found. And on the time that the bodies were called, like the call, 12.56 p.m. was when the call came in. So that is why it's the date and the hour of death. Not that that's when they died, but that's when they were found and when they were notified. Right, but this is this is just bad because... Um, because of of the way that that they say when the when you know when they when we're being told that the bodies have been there for three for three weeks there's nothing here that sh like you're saying there's nothing here that shows that they were there for for three weeks right. um i mean they 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 never say based on these reports the bodies were there for for three weeks they never say that the medical examiner reports show that maybe they weren't there for for three weeks either they're just very tricky with with some of that stuff obviously this is not the only thing that they've been kind of tricky with but this is a this is a pretty big deal i mean if this is another smoking gun definitely here well, and maybe i'm not explaining it this is i'm, I'm trying to explain how and this is done across the board on mm -hmm on just about every, I, I would imagine, in every um, medical examiner's office across the United States. If you, they do not know for sure the time of date, even though they can say early to moderate, they're not going to, by law, they have to list the time and date of death as to when they were found. Got it. And then from that, then they add, okay, was it early to moderate, was it advanced, what state of decomp were they, but still, the date of death is going to be the date they were found, and that's just the legalities of it. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, you're also saying that it makes absolutely no sense. This is way more work uh, to do it this way. It would take way too much time. There's, there's absolutely no reason why, why they would do it this way. As far as the template, as far as what they put out there. Oh, the template back here. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, so much more time to fill in a template than just to type it out. I am telling you, sense. It's, it's 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 odd. It's really odd. I mean, they just need to say we don't know. That I I understand for the legal reason they have to put when when it was found, but maybe I mean, I don't know. It just it just well seems because it's understood in the in in that field of work. You know, when you're in that that medical field and you're working for the, when they write that, it is understood by everybody that that's what that means. To the general layperson outside, yeah, we'll go, well, wait, you know, if they were found on the 17th, but we know they died sooner, why did they, we don't understand it. Yeah, but yeah. But they do. It's, it's, it's their lingo. Yeah, it just, it's just same, They did the same thing with JFK, remember? Two different autopsy reports? Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. like Handy Stuck, uh, apparently the coroner didn't pronounce him dead. Uh, the people were pronounced dead before the coroner even had a chance to. And the coroner is the one who um, does the final report. You know, again, that's one of my favorite cases. That's why I bring it because I see a lot of parallels between that and this. And, and the, uh, the former, uh, the Handy Sook, um, that was, in my opinion, uh, one of the greatest false flags ever been committed on American soil. Um, all goes along with some of the things that David Crowley was trying to show us, and that's something that we're not allowed to talk about. We actually have to use fake, fake words and uh, you know, change the letters up to even have a discussion about that. But uh, again, Greg, Greg, you know my passion <laughs> about yeah, uh, Andy said and what it did, um, and to have this this type of panel on uh, doing this type of um, deep autopsy reports, and such, um, ooh, yeah. I'd love it. You know, and, and the thing too is that, um, you know, Eric, I, there was um, a spreadsheet that Will just completed and he sent it to, to me not too long ago. And it was amazing. And it was covering these autopsy reports. I am telling you, this guy, I just looked at that and, and it was exactly how my brain thinks. When he looked, when I'm looking at this, this spreadsheet, he listed every single aspect, but in a in concise manner that if you want to know, okay, what was this? You look at that page and boom, it's right there. It was amazing. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, that's, I just, I just can't get over that. For, for some reason, it just, I don't know. It just, that really, one of the main things that really bothers me. One of, one of many things. So <laughs> it must be, 
it's just, it's just crazy how you hear you know because that's that was the the main thing. Every news report said that you know I think even the press release reports even said that the bodies were there for for three weeks, et cetera, et cetera. And it's like you know within with the autopsies don't match that. The autopsies don't don't say that. They just say when when it was found. Um, I would I would rather I mean shouldn't there be some type of conclusion or something like in indeterminate when the bodies you know how long the bodies have been in the in in the house shouldn't the medical yeah, examiner put that in here can I just, well well Greg can I just bring up sure. a point now just like Handy Sook what we have here um, again yeah, yeah. Valley Police declared a murder suicide like almost immediately yeah well I want to bring up a, a hey, valid sir. point I want to bring up a, I want to bring up a valid point. So, back in the 90s when I was living in Western Australia, they had what they call the Claremont, the Claremont Serial Killer. Now, can someone just type that in? The Claremont, I want to find out when they found that one of the, the, the first body in the bushland, how long after that body was found in the scrubland because they found that body decomposed. Now, she was abducted at Claremont, three women was abducted. One of the women was never found, that was Sarah Spears. I want to compare that when they found that body, because I believe that body was found in a short space of time after they were abducted and murdered, to the Crowley case. Because if the body was found within three weeks after the body was abducted, then we can say something here. Was it outside? What was the temperature? I mean, there's a lot of variables. You right. know, unless she was, it was winter time and it was 30 degrees or colder outside okay. in the house. You can't really. Okay. We're not talking. We don't want to look at the first one. Sarah Spears was not found. I want to go to the second person. The second person. It was in winter, early hours of Sunday, 9th of June, 1996. Jane Rimmer. That is winter here in Australia. Okay, and was she outside? I, I don't know this case, so I'm asking. Was she found outside or inside? She was at a nightclub, but okay. she met a, she met a guy. Apparently, he offered her a lift, and he abducted and killed her inside his own vehicle, and body was dumped in the scrubland. So the okay. body was outside. Yeah, so her, her decomp rate is going to be different than it was at the Crowley's. But she was murdered inside the vehicle. It, it doesn't matter where you're murdered. It's mattered where your body yeah. ends up being located during the decomp process. I mean, I shouldn't say it doesn't matter where you're murdered because, I mean, obviously. It doesn't. But in, in this. In body, this where the body is when it's yeah. found. Yeah. Yes. I want to find, yeah, but I want to find, what, 50, well, okay, 55 days later on in August. Yeah, so it was, her body, the second person was 55 days later after her abduction and murder, right? So when was... Yeah, because if it's winter time there, how cold does it get? Do you know how cold it gets in, there? In, in Perth, in Perth, you can get down to minus four degrees Celsius. So I'm, okay, so pretty cold. It is cold. It is cold. And she was abducted in like one, two o'clock in the morning. Okay, so in this case, and it's just a guess, um, and especially since he, even though he killed her in a car, he dumped her body outside. It's winter time. It gets super cold. So she could have been frozen. So the body would have been kind of preserved. And again, it's not the same. I don't think we could compare that to the Crowleys. No, no, no. But I'm just saying when the body was found, her body was found 55. I thought her body was, was found in a short space of time. But no. Jane... Jane Rimmer's body was found 55 days after her abduction and murder, according to the Crowley's, what, three weeks, give or take? Yeah, 55 days, that's, that's almost two months. Yeah, almost, almost two months. It's a month and a half. Yeah. And the third body, that's um, yeah, yeah the, third, the third body, which was nine months later, um, she was abducted at the same spot, 12.30, that was at the end of summer of 97. Her body was found 19 days later. 19 days later, the third body, um, Kira Glennon, 
So Sarah Spears was not found. Her body has never been found. But the third body was um, Clara Glennon. It was found 19 days later. Well, what do you think the correlation to this is, uh, to the Crowley case? Because it seems like... No, I'm just comparing because they were saying that the, the body was mummified. I'm just saying, all right, how long after the murder, so to speak, till they found the body? And I'm just saying, okay, I know two bodies that were found in a case over in Western Australia that were decomposed. We we're talking about the decomposition. Rather than inside, as far as the state of the body, right? No, it doesn't matter. I'm not talking about whether it's inside or not. I'm just saying how quickly can a body decompose? That is the point, though, Jamie, because it matters where the body is located and it matters the, the elements well, I, matter. Well, well, I, well he, this is just my opinion. I believe the bodies of David Crowley and the family were murdered outside the house, not inside. I don't and, have any proof. I don't have any proof. I mean, that could be very well true. I mean, it, it really could, but that... But again, their bodies then lay inside the house, and and again, it's yeah, just as, as a as, as a stage play. It, it, like people got to understand that trick photography can be in play here by the police department. It's possible they were murdered dead for a very long time before their bodies were placed there and discovered. Exactly. Is that what you're getting at? I mean, that's possible. But, well, I mean, trick photography. Had, has been running rampant for so many decades. It would not surprise me that the police enforcement used trick photography on where they... It would just seem like that would take so much work. I mean, you're talking about clowns that use the same crisis actors for multiple events within the same year. You know, I mean, it's just, that was so much extra work. And you know what, what Jamie is saying, though, is I know a lot of other people have said the same thing, and that's the frustrating thing about not being able to get the entire ME's report. Now, there are two separate reports. There's an autopsy report and an ME report. And the ME report is usually the one that's really long and, and very thorough. And that would be where it would state um, if they had noticed if a body was frozen. Because you can tell on autopsy, generally, if there's early stages of decomp, you can tell if a body has been frozen. It, it does, it, things look different under a microscope. But because we, no matter what, we cannot ever get access to that because we're the public, we won't know. So were they frozen and placed? We don't know. What, what type of things would, would we want to look for to see if the bodies were frozen? We can't see it on this report. Even if you're looking at it, it's not going to list it. No, I know, but just <laughs> in, in, in general. Yeah. With that they would, yeah, things like different, um, you know, how the skin is affected. Were there any crystals, crystallizations, anything within the, the skin layers? You know, generally stuff you would find under a microscope. But, yeah, in a regular autopsy, unless they decide they want to write that, and they just don't for the most part, we'll never know. Yeah. Would someone be able to FOIA that? No, no, because the ME's reports are generally never released to the public for any reason. Interesting. Maybe in a court case. But... I don't even, I mean. Really? Not even good in a luck. Yeah, wow. it would take a serious, uh, serious attempt in a courtroom to get it released. And that's just across the board for anybody. Wow. That's sad. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just saying, I'm just. Yeah. The way the body was laid out in the lounge room, and that, uh, it was. I'm just saying, all right, I, I hate being this type of person, but I'm just saying it for what I see it. Sure. I reckon they were placed there to make a scene. They, the police came in, they did a video footage, they did some photos, boom, there's your, there's, there's your case, done. You know, that's what they did. Oh, it, their bodies definitely look yeah, staged. I think we all agree with that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, looking on the outside, looking in, I reckon they were murdered at a different location. Someone transported the bodies there, left it there, opened the back door, just the lights, the kitchen door, whatever it is, just a slight ajar, right? And, and yeah. David is laying in a, in a crucifix, basically. His arms are completely spread out. I mean, that is is pretty odd for for what they're saying he, he did to shoot himself with his right hand that is missing where the gun ends up on the other side of him next to his left hand and and his hands are both completely sprawled out anybody that walks into that crime scene you're not going to forget that that's going to be a, right. 
that's going to stick to another yeah, thing too it. about the crime scene of the house there was no commotion or there was no type of um struggle with the offender mm. with the with with the with the, the person that's carrying out the act and the protect like the defenders like the crowley fan it's either, it's either one or two, it's only one or two scenarios here. One, that the Crowleys knew the perpetrator that did the, the shooting, or two, that they were murdered somewhere else and placed back at the crime scene of the house. It's only two things. No, I think you're right about the first part of it. I think that's more than likely what it is. Um, I think they had to have known the person. Um, as for struggle, I know... Most of us are probably going to go and have different scenarios in our heads, and uh, we're going to probably think different things in this. But me, my belief is I do think there was a slight struggle. Um, I don't think there was much room to struggle, really, at that point. I think it was very quick. It's just done. Um, I think David probably tried to defend against whoever uh, killed Brinia, and then ended up getting killed himself, and Kamel didn't have much of a chance to go and get out of the way, and she was killed. But it, we know it had to have been somebody that they knew because they were in a comfortable uh, setting. There was no direct sense struggle. There was no broken door in, like the door wasn't kicked in, anything like this. Right. Everything else, for the most part, looked relatively normal. Plus, on top of that, we have the hair dye um, kit that was right there in the, I believe it was in the garbage, if I'm not mistaken. And then you've also got, uh, it does, I mean, Kamel's hair kind of looked like it was probably previously dyed. Or like just had been died. I mean, women uh, died there all the time, so it could have been. Well, died. exactly. But then you've also got um, uh, the whole kitchen, where that how that whole setup is. Obviously, they hadn't gone to bed. I would assume when they go to bed, they'd probably go and flip their dishwasher so it's closed. I would assume because well, we didn't see a whole lot of like dog hair, for instance, inside of the um, the dishwasher. So therefore, it probably wasn't down very long. I would argue, um, probably down for a little bit. They, it looks well, like they just finished night. dinner. So, or some kind of a meal. So, I think they were in a comfortable uh, setup there, basically. They were, it was probably somebody came over or people came over, and they just they got to that point. And then just bam, they just off the family. And when you have that many shots, right? You have seven, seven shots, mm -hmm. I believe, seven shots fired. Nobody is, is, is reporting between. December 24th, December 25th, right? December 26th. Mm -hmm. Nobody's re reporting hearing more than one neighbor lived next to them um, is, you know, not Judy's, not uh, Colin Proc now. The, the other neighbor heard maybe, maybe two shots um, sometime, and he, and he didn't know when. He didn't know if it was sometime between Christmas Eve or possibly New Year's, but definitely not seven shots. Nobody's re right. re reporting that. And so I think that's, you know, the whole theory that they were, that the bodies were, um, that they weren't killed there, you know, makes, um, makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that's why a lot of people take it seriously. I'm still open to it. It's, it's a big risk to move, try to move three bodies into that house. Um, they would have to know, right? Points have a lot of validity though. Yeah. Oh well, yeah. The food, oh. the food contents is what's got me. I, I, I think they were killed there. I still that's that's the part that's got me held in. They were killed there, but there's a lot of cleaning done. You would go I into the, uh, where the where the uh, gun trace was, where the uh, traces of gunpowder, where there would be right. There's none of that. You know that type of stuff. It to go into that. And I, that that's kind of why um, I kind of support. They they were probably murdered there because just. Like a lot of work. Work pillows. Well, and there were there was also void patterns. So was something laid down? Is that why most of the blood is not there? It's it's a possibility. We don't know, but there are yeah. void patterns within the blood spatter. I guess Jamie would uh, look at the wall too. Still there is that. Like it was clean. Would have to actually pull up and put those bodies back um, in a neighborhood. You know, in a residential neighborhood, it would make more sense just to go into the house and do it, especially somebody they knew. Right, and especially because you've got some people, not going to mention names, but some people that had mentioned, um, Why not close to David, about the whole, uh, you know, the sound quality of the home and where it could, you know, basically where the least amount of sound would be coming from. Um, there's things like that, but, you know, why, why mention sound, right? Well, we know that um, there was one neighbor who heard my guess is it was probably done late at night or early in the morning before people were really up. 
to that area. This guy must have just been out there, like over in his like living room or something, watching TV, and heard something. That's my guess. Um, he was probably one of the only people up over near that house, and they heard it because their volume or whatever. They were able to go and get a couple from there, but the thing is, we're not seeing any stifling. We're not seeing anything like this. We're not seeing um, residue from the gun itself on the heads um, or or anywhere else in the body. So why is that? You know, that's also a big part. Right. Well, funny you mention that because I know um, I keep bringing up my surroundings, Australia. If something like this happened in my area, the neighbours will be coming out of the woodwork trying to check on what actually occurred. If they heard some type of commotion or gunshot or anything, this is right. this is what the neighbor. So my question is, why didn't any of the neighbourhood do the same thing in response to? this right. i mean we've heard rumors that there was some argument going on inside the house okay well why didn't you approach the house if you heard some arguing some people say oh we heard some fire crack we thought we heard some fire crackers going on right well if that's the case why don't you go and do what a normal citizen would do if you want what normal okay anyway just like any other citizen would in the neighbourhood, would go and check on your surroundings. And it's not right. like it's not like they've got divided fences like we do here in Australia. Our our neighbours, you've got to look over the fence into someone else's property. In the, in this scenario, the property was open. You can walk onto the property at any given time. Right. That's true. So why didn't the neighbours do what? Some type of justice for people, you know. I mean, uh, then you got to go and you got to remember about how people are. Look at the case of that Kitty Genovese. Well, that's the way society is at the moment. They don't give a damn care about anybody, or less than exactly. Alone. They don't really care about themselves. I mean, I'm only speaking for myself. If I was there, I would have, I would have right. on, I would have checked on the too. property. Yeah. Well, ask yourself this too. This is the other thing that's been bothering me too. Where are all the pillows, and why are the pillows that are on the couch why are they mismatched? Well, what about the house directly behind the house? Well, well, I mean, well hang on a second. Hang on a second, Steve. This is what I want to get at here, because yeah. we're looking at. Well, we looked at the gunshots, right? We know that one person had possibly heard something, right? Well, then we got Mason Hendricks. Well, okay. Well, I guess I mentioned him now. Whoops. Um, who had mentioned sound quality in the home. Um, you know, so could it have been possible? And he, I think, he, if I'm not mistaken, it, Greg would probably be able to back up on this. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, didn't he also say something along the lines of, well, he could have done it with all the pillows and the way the house is situated, the acoustics <laughs> of it or whatever, it would have been possible, right? Yeah, he said that. <laughs> right. Okay, see, so you get where I'm going with this. Well, then we got a bunch of cotton on the ground. Okay, we can see just tufts of that everywhere, but then we're seeing some pillows that are fine, but they're mismatched. They don't look like they want with these this this couch. I'm gonna go and I'm actually this is gonna be something I gotta look at here. So I wanna go and see if these are the pillows that came with the couch. I don't think they are. I think these were just uh, pillows that had a similar color, and but they had different backs on them. But I don't think these pillows they've got on there. I don't think they came with it. And then with also the the garbage and all this being gone. And we know that happened, I believe it was every Tuesday, if I'm not mistaken. Let me go and double check that. But I believe it's every Tuesday, the garbage would come by. Right. And over in his area, I'm bringing it up right now. Let's see, Tuesday. Yeah, that'd be Tuesday. So then you got to look at their calendar for when they would come. They, somebody had to have taken that out. And if pillows were used to muffle the noise, which it could, um, you know, maybe I would say probably a couple of pillows. Um, would make sense, but if he's once again, we don't know how many shots this guy actually heard. If he only heard like one or two, well, then how many pillows were used? Did they use the same pillow and just kind of just move, you know, move it over so that we can get some more muffling? I don't know, but it was interesting to me too because I mean, uh, for assuming this is probably a professional hit, then uh, they would certainly have used silencers, so as not to alert the neighbors. I mean, that just that's <laughs> gangster 101. I was just about to go on to say that, Eric. Yeah, yeah, if that, but if that then, was but I thought it was, what, that was never brought up uh, by Mason or anyone else either. It was, but the pillow thing was. 
Well, then we'd have to... I mean, that's the thing. Is we'd have to actually look at the gun itself. Is the gun that's got blood on all this, was that actually the one used? What we're seeing from the reports, if I'm not mistaken, um, I'm pretty sure I'm 100% on this, that uh, that was the gun used. They were able to go and deduce that. That was the gun used. But then you see in there that that trash is empty right there. That's yeah, but, interesting. But this one isn't. So There's, there's something in this one. You got a couple pieces. This has just been emptied. <clears throat> yeah, but somebody put some saying. something in here, right? Or or do you think when it was dumped, this like stuck to the bottom of it? Or I, I think that just kind of just happened to be just left in there. On that. What are we looking at here? What is this? So this is a That's photo of of David's garbage can. Uh, yeah, one one of his trash cans. So this is one of them where there's still a two couple pieces here. Something is ripped up. Um, and then the other one. So one is the recycling. This is probably the trash. Um, and then this is probably the re recycling, but it was always weird that there was like these two little pieces of, of, uh, paper here, or maybe three. And, um, I just always thought that, that, that was kind of, kind of odd too, that like, yeah. Un uh, I mean, it would make sense if, if they were stuck, if these are stuck to the bottom and that's why they yeah. didn't come out or something. But aside from, from that, you know, I don't know. I don't, uh, okay, so uh, these just these two pieces of paper were found um, in the recycling bin, and obviously you can see the snow here and such. Yeah, this is an actual picture. Um, was the recycling bin open at the time, or did they open it up? They, they opened it up. They opened it. Okay. Up. Yeah. I mean, even if they did, oh uh, no, that, forget that. That's yeah. thanks for answering the question. Yeah, and there's uh, there's a few little uh, droplets that I always thought were maybe were blood or something. But, uh, packages on the porch that were neatly stacked and um, for weeks, <laughs> but. It, Somehow they were not touched by the weather whatsoever. Yeah. Can you zoom in on that, by chance? Sorry, what? There you go. Oh, those are interesting. Yeah, I'll be honest, I didn't ever notice those. Yeah, well, I don't know what they are, they, but... They, yeah, that blood, that blood. That was interesting that they were never really talked about or mentioned or anything like that. Yeah, it's I, I don't. So things yeah. like this, that's weathering they're, and all this. They're, like, they're perfect the circles, though. I mean, I don't know if they're blood because would blood be that perfect? You know what I mean? I don't know what. <laughs> I don't know someone what it could be. A, but... Someone had a nose bleed. That's a big <laughs> nose. It's a damn big nose. <laughs> was there any way to zoom in on the note? Have you ever had a, a tried to even look what it was? Yeah. Right yeah. Um. It looks like, like almost like um, sometimes we get those bank statement things. Because if yeah. you look at this side, this is like the back end of something here um, that we used to get. But it could be just spam, too. It could be, you know, snail right. mail, somebody sent That'll spam. That'll like one of those old pay slips that you get here in Australia that you put your freaking cash in. Who just yeah. slaps one piece of paper into their recycling bin randomly? I mean, this is, this is interesting. It's kind of weird. Yeah, it's kind of weird. Uh, it, looks, it looks like a pay slip. <laughs> yeah. And it's just it's just there. So I mean, there's not that many people that are that are going to dump that in their garbage by by itself, I would think. Right. But it's kind well, of in the middle of winter too, it's a little more work. I mean, okay, we could say they pulled up with their vehicle and decided that they just had to dump this letter yeah. in there, but that makes no sense. Oh, more pictures. And I've already hey, had it, thousands it, here. Thousand and one. Here's another question: Why didn't they fingerprint the paperwork? Yeah, I don't know. There's a lot of things they probably should have done some tests on they didn't do. I mean, that that I, I get where that comes from is that does come down to money, so we'd have to look at what kind of funding did their lab have um, and things like this. You'd have to look at things like that. Yeah. So what tests are going to be allowed to run? But even then, you know, basically it's going to come down to budget. It will come down to that. So if this is a very, very low, um, a low budget uh, police department, and they bring, you know, they're bringing in the DCN and all this. So then we're looking at, okay, who's getting this, uh, you know, who's paying for this? Is it going to be the county or is it going to be the city? Right. Right. So this was the other thing that kind of kind of looked weird because when I first saw this, like, well, that looks like blood. I don't know what blood would look like if it's dried up, set in in here. Um, so I don't know. I would think it would be darker, but I don't, I really don't don't know. So I don't know what this is. Greg, I, these are certainly our crime scene photos, right? I mean, because I mean, they wouldn't. I, I wouldn't think that they would go to go to the trash. Who, who did this? Are these crime scene photos? Yeah, yeah, these are. Yeah. They took a they took a whole lot of crime scene photos. They sure yeah. did. It's like they're they poking sure fun did. at you. Yeah, they took a lot of them, um, and they didn't want to share them. Yeah, it just. 
looking through some of these photos, look like everything's been placed there. What I call trick photography. Yeah. Right? It's been placed there. It had to be in a specific, had to be in a in a specific way. It's got to be in a specific position. It looks like trick photography. Anyone can do this. Even yeah. us, if we really wanted to. Trick photography. Yeah. Great points, my friends. Um, I think we need to wrap wrap this one up here, but um, I would like to get some final thoughts from from everyone. I mean, um, tomorrow is January seventeenth, twenty twenty two, and that will mark seven years since since the bodies were found. Um, so I know Catherine may have may have some thoughts on on that, and um, I think she wants to come back tomorrow, and. Uh, we're going to go through everything that kind of happened, everything that we know about January 17th. Is that right, Catherine? Um, yeah. yeah. And yeah. I, I just thought it was going to be a, a kind of like a good way to remember the family and mm -hmm. then to bring to light, yeah, the basics of the case of what we know for sure. So, you know, we keep them in the public eye and remember them. It's currently the 17th of January here in Australia. Monday the seventeenth. So yeah, you're a time uh, traveler. You know, I'm doing a whole show on everything we know about the case tonight. <laughs> everything that's 110 percent fact. Oh yeah, that's right. We'll we'll tell tell people where people can um where they can watch uh, you, you guys. Live. Can find me on twitch.tv backslash strange investigations. That is as strange as in S T R A N G E investigations. All one word. Um, and that will be starting tonight at about. 9 p.m. Okay, and then Jamie, you're so, you're you're on oh, Twitch wait, too. Time zone. Oh yeah, time zone. Uh, Pacific okay. Standard Time. Uh, okay. I'll catch on. I'll be only live streaming today on Twitch. Um, I'm banned on YouTube. Both the channels are banned. So yeah, Southern Cruise Two or Southern Cruise Seventy Nine on Twitch. Um, the last time we did David Crowley on Twitch, I got a 35 day ban because we showed the photos of the crime scene with the dead bodies. Um, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, um, yeah. We we don't have freedom of of, of speech. Um, that's what it is. We don't. We've been. I mean, with, with the bodies, I mean, I get that to some degree. That one, yeah. I, I understand that part. But when it comes to uh, like, just because so, I know that they they do have a policy on that one, I do know that. But I mean, yeah. So 10 p.m. Eastern, I'll be on Twitch tonight and tomorrow and Wednesday, which is two day time. I'll be back on YouTube. Awesome. Hell yeah, man. Um, and Mr. Spitfire, you're still on YouTube. Your your thirtieth channel has not been banned yet, as far as I know. No, I've had I think ten now. <laughs> Once I lost the one with over a million views, I just I keep class at this point. I just keep creating them. You can find me at the Sentinels of Truth um on YouTube for as long as they'll allow me to stay up and then if it gets taken down, then I'll just create another one <laughs> under the Sentinels of Truth. And I nice. Again, it's been a pleasure being on this uh, broadcast with all y'all, um, learning, writing things down, looking at things from a whole different uh, perspective at times. Um, things that I had no idea about. I would love, Greg, are you down for this at some point? Um, Absolutely. Doing a show and, and going over Handy Sook. Absolutely. Whenever you want. There's so there's so many similarities. Do you have the um, the coroner's re reports for those, Eric? that case are there any out there or? i mean I, I briefly skimmed over you know the basics when when you say do your own research it generally most don't go as deep as yes and uh <laughs> and uh, the other guest what is your name who me will or yes. Catherine? or what are you talking about ross ross yeah, um, yeah ross just joined more, more deeply into the right down to it makes no sense that the uh format this, these foreign reports makes no sense because it would take too long. These are just there's just so many different. Um, not we'd have to probably do a two day show. If we we're going to do a handy sip one. That, sure. That was. But I'm I, digressing again. Most people, when you say it, talk about doing your own research, they only kind of scrape the surface. And you guys are doing like a full forensic file type thing here, and I love it. Yeah. <laughs> so if, if you have, you know, if if, if you on the corner is supposed to pronounce uh, mm -hmm. deceased. Um, not police at the scene, but this has happened to many false flags. Yeah, I, I think it w it would be nice to get Catherine's thoughts on the on the coroner's re report if you, if you have sure. a copy of those or if you can get those. I'll do that. Okay. This is this is deep deep research way down the rabbit hole. Thanks again. 
You got it. And um, Ross, any final words here while we um, while we uh, close this one down? I know you got some Zodiac stuff, some good Zodiac stuff going on. So. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. So sorry, guys. I uh, I did have to do some ghost hunting after I fell off. Uh, I have Zodiac Files episode three, the Sherry Joe Bates mystery. Uh, that is 1966 Riverside City College. Some consider it a bit of an ancillary case to the main Zodiac mystery, but uh, it's going to be interesting nonetheless. Check that out. Uh, i got a couple more interviews coming out on my channel, youtube.com slash planetxfilm. And, uh, I don't know, Greg, there seems to be uh, some, uh, some, you know, uh, uh, disagreement that I'm an associate producer on Gray State, so do I need to uh, screenshot stop that and send it to you? <laughs> I mean, I'd, I'd really hate to waste my time doing such a thing, but uh, you know how the Internet is nowadays. I would not waste your time, brother. Just keep on going. Stay, stay focused with it. And uh, people who want to find find that out, they they definitely can. We've done multiple shows on it, and we'll continue to do. I will. Zodiac, uh, Planet X, huh? Yep. yep. Love it. Great yep. stuff. Yeah, if you go to Planet Planet yep. X yep. Filmworks, he he's got a whole playlist on like Zodiac stuff. It's really cool. Really good stuff. Cool oh, pleasure. Um, Greg, can I can I add something in here real Please, quick? Please go for it. Um, I want to take this moment again to give a shout out to William. Um, the stuff that he brought up about the mold, um, I had never even paid attention to. I just took it as, well, whatever, it's just part of decomp. But he brought up some really good, valuable points, uh, um, valid points. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Will, for your work. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, definitely appreciate that. Yeah, I agree. Um, that was interesting. Yeah, the, the the mold thing is really really a trip. I'm gonna have to sit on that one and really kind of think think about that. But I'm really curious um, to hear more ab about that. Um, Catherine, any final words? Let let people know where they where they can catch you and your your channel too. You have a new interview out too that I thought was pretty awesome. Yes, I, I just recently did an interview with Crypt Rick, and he had actually spoken with um, a veterinarian who had 60 plus years of, of work in the field and gave a lot of really good informa information about animal predation, what uh, they will or will not do. And you can find that on my YouTube channel. Um, I, I don't even, I, just find me under my name, Catherine Michelle. Um, but yeah, it's it was a pretty interesting and, and I learned some things that I did not know about dogs and what they would do. So, yeah. Excellent. All right, everyone. Well, I want to thank you all for joining us here for this special round round table. And we had a lot of people on and um, I thank you everybody in our chat room who was checking that out and everyone who will watch this in the future. God bless you all. And we'll definitely do another one of these shows soon. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Greg. For sure. Real, real quick, Greg. Yeah, uh, I got an interview coming up on Crypt Rick too. A deep dive on my Zodiac project. So uh, oh. look out for that. Shout out to him and Greg for hooking that up. Thanks, guys. Nice, nice. Looking forward, looking forward to that one. Yeah, the Zodiac oh. one is a fascinating. Hey. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the resistance. Peace, 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 peace. peace. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well.